Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome at PBL, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And a special welcome to the people here in The Hague, but also, of course, to the guests and the people who are online. We found that there is a massive interest in this forum. We had four, over 400 people who wanted to attend. And uh, the people online are from all over the world, so there's a real interest in this discussion that is taking place today. I introduce myself. My name is André Vallamre. I'm the deputy director of PBL. And uh, we are very happy and very, very uh, honored to host this meeting here today. I would like to have a special welcome from people who, were, who traveled all the way to The Hague from abroad and especially for our Ukrainian guests because they have had trips. I spoke to them already, to a few of them, and I've heard that it's a very uh, difficult trip to get here and it's very, we are very happy that they were able to make it and contribute to this, to this program. So very welcome to them and of course also very welcome to the Ukrainian um, people online. Also a very special welcome to the ambassadors for the Ukraine and from the Netherlands and they will be in the end of the program and give also a statement to this forum. And of course the many experts on the housing and urban planning here together as well as the representatives from local governments, local governments from the Ukraine but also local governments from the Netherlands. And it's very good to look for the interaction during the breaks. This seminar will also be recorded and be put online. So for people who missed it and to interest your colleagues who might want to look back at it, at the end we will put it on the internet also with a Ukrainian translation and an English translation uh, subtitles back to it. Nearly one year ago, uh, the war started in Ukraine and a lot has happened um, with this terrible war and a lot of things changed for everybody in the Ukraine. And of course, that had enormous impacts. And I could say that, well, the war is still going on, that we still hear the news about new offensive uh, techniques from, uh, from Russia. Why do we start talking about housing? Why do we start talking about this topic of today? And from our point of view, we say, well, recovery requires time. You have to start thinking, it needs time to think about it. But it's also, it gives perspective. It gives hope and it gives a perspective on the future. And that's also important in these days. And that's for us as PBL, one of the reasons to organize it, because we don't have a lot of possibilities to, to help and to, 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 to work together with our colleagues, but we do have experience on research, on science, on housing, on science policy interface, etc., etc. So we are very happy that we were able to organize this together with our lot of colleagues. We did this uh, organization of this forum with uh, specialists from the Netherlands, but also specialists from the Ukraine. And I would like to mention a few. Uh, one of them is the new housing policy organization, uh, Alexander Anzimov and Pavlo Fedorov. The Ukraine Netherlands U Urban Network, UNUN, of which Alexandra uh, will get the floor after me to introduce it to you. And with Julie Lawson, who is also a professor at uh, RMIT University, but also the lead author of the UN's Housing 2030 report. And of course, many, many other people, and um, particularly also Ukrainians living in the Netherlands, most of them women, and some of them are here in the audience, who work here in the profession of architecture, urban design, spatial planning, and are now based in the Netherlands because of the wars, of course. So far for my introduction, I will go through the program after I give the floor to Alexandra to introduce herself and UN UN. Alexandra. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone, for coming and very warm welcome. My name is Alexandra Tkachenko, and I represent Ukraine Netherlands Urban Network. And as we already all know, that a year ago, when the war started, I mean, the first day, everybody was just in freeze and shock, like what to do. But it didn't take long time for Ukrainians just to get together and act. And this example of resistance and act was quite um, taking others in other countries. Uh, and everybody wanted to help and to help. And this is how actually Ukraine Netherlands Network started. This example was really um, like a virus <laughs> going around, getting everybody. Uh, I can talk a lot about uh, Ukraine, our UN UN, but I would say that PBL is one of uh, this uh, conference is one of the best examples how Dutch institution together with Ukrainian institution together with international help organize something together get together and the atmosphere is always very inspiring and you start dreaming about it you feel of a lot of energy but then you go back home you check your news and you get hit by reality back again because you see the price that Ukraine is paying to have to give us this chance to dream. Um, you, get, you can see that people are dying there and this is the price we pay for that. There are many uh, urban professionals, architects who are not able to be with us here and plan a future for Ukraine because they are there on the front line, because they're given their lives to give us this chance to dream. And I would encourage you not to waste this moment and I bet you all will enjoy it and a lot of information, not good only for Ukraine, but also for Dutch to think about their housing crisis. Um, but I would encourage each of you here in the room and also online to think, how would you use this information? How, what would you do? What would be your next step and just be thoughtful of what we're doing here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alexandra. And I think it's a good mission for this afternoon is to, to help to dream uh, about how it can be after this whole thing is over. I would like to go through the program. And we have a very full program and that means that we will be strictly strict in timekeeping. So I would like to invite the speakers to really keep the allocated time. And we will give you a warning one minute before the time is over. We first have a, sh a short session uh, and I will tell a little bit more about that after I went through the program. That's a kind of introduction. And then there are three blocks about the content. And the first one is about Ukraine's challenges ahead. And there will be several presentations in that. After that, there will be a block which goes about the securing affordable housing. And there will also be different presentations. And then we will have the coffee break. After the coffee break, we will start discussing because if you have the houses, you, don't st you do not have automatically neighborhoods where you want to live, where your social activities are, what your uh, living environment is. And that's for the final block about the content. It's about the neighborhoods. And then finally, there will be a short block with a call to action because we have discussed then for the whole afternoon all kinds of ideas we have dreamt, we have been dreaming, I hope, but then it's time to wake up and make it uh, translate it into real actions. And we also have some very highly recognized speakers on that area. So that's the program. And um, we are starting now because time is precious. And the opening address is going to be given by Alexandra Asakinya. She's deputy minister uh, for homes and neighborhoods in Ukraine, but she's delayed. She will appear this afternoon uh, around three o'clock, but due to her 
busy agenda. She couldn't make it now uh, at quarter past two. So we move that, and when she gets online, we will interrupt the program and give her the floor for her opening statement. The second presentation is where we will start with, and that's the presentation by Mr. Christoph Jirulski from the European Commission, who has been working with Ukraine in his uh, job for about eight, nine years, and he will give an opening statement by the European Commission. Welcome. Ja, goeiedag, good afternoon. Dobroga dnia, szanowni kolegi, wszystkim uczestnikom naszej zustrzyci w zale i online. I have been indeed working uh, uh, from the European Commission, uh, in the European Commission, in a special task force, which used to be called until 1st of February of this year, Support Group for Ukraine, uh, helping with reforms, especially in the field of energy efficiency. But uh, as you can imagine, things like energy efficiency immediately after, I think, one of the first my visits uh, to Kiev, to Ukraine, we realized very quickly that uh, the big uh, area to address is housing, is buildings, residential sector in particular. And something which uh, we, uh, we need to keep in mind is that uh, while we talk about, uh, we'll be talking the full event uh, about uh, recovery, reconstruction in the housing sector, I have to remember that uh, the state of the housing already uh, before the war was not so good in Ukraine. Uh, these buildings were, we, we used to say generally, on, on average, were consuming three times more of energy than average in Europe, in the EU. So I think many of them required, uh, required that attention. I have some photos, but here. Degree. No. Oh, yeah. So. <clears throat> A lot, a lot has been already done, and uh, you know about uh, uh, Ukraine's aspiration to join the EU. It has been given the, the candidate status. Some people are asking sometimes, well, is it just because of the war? Well, I can, I can assure you that this is not just because of the war. A lot of reforms have been done, have been done also in the housing sector. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, much more sometimes than in other countries uh, which started the succession path much earlier, like in the Balkans. So it's not, not an accident. A lot of things started to happen already. The EU helped a lot with this, with these reforms. Reforms meaning changings of entire legislative framework. I would spend too much time probably to explain what it has been. Uh, but uh, even though housing, is, strictly speaking, is not part of the EU acquis, it is an important element of the economy. Uh, if it is consuming, uh, like say, 40% of energy of the country, and we know how energy geopolitically is important in Ukraine, then you cannot not address the buildings. Something fantastic which happened uh, in Ukraine, and it took a lot of effort from the EU as well, uh, was related to the creation of energy efficiency fund, energy efficiency fund to address the residential buildings renovations. It took four years to establish because we had to establish this from zero. There was no existing institution that would have sufficient trust of the donors. The EU and Germany came, the EU provided 104 million euros, Germany provided 20 million, and Ukrainian government contributed from the state budget because it has been a joint uh, initiative. And these are just examples of uh, buildings which have been refurbished, there have been a lot of them across Ukraine. Uh, most of them are still there. And uh, surprisingly, of course, you can see on the left-hand side what was before, on the right-hand side, generally, what has been done. You can see it from the outside, but a lot more has been happening inside the buildings, uh, including all the, all the hydraulics, all the heating systems, a lot of things, investments have been done with involvement of the homeowners. This is a fantastic thing which happened also in, in Ukraine. The movement of homeowners associations uh, is, uh, is great. 
doesn't, to my knowledge, exist to such an extent in any other country of the Eastern Partnership. So now uh, I can say that this experience uh, we, um, we had in Ukraine, the Energy Efficiency Fund, by the way, is functioning despite the war, is implementing projects despite the war. Uh, okay, the projects were started before uh, new applications are not uh, accepted, but because, not because people don't want, but because banks are not ready to provide loans that would be accepted by, by the homeowners. Uh, great results, well, 40-50% of reduction of energy consumption happened already in many, many buildings. You can see many more examples on the website of, uh, of the Energy Efficiency Fund. Now, after the start of the war, the situation, of course, dramatically uh, changed. Uh, and also in the European Commission, I have to say, we started doing things I would never imagine we would be doing, with the speed uh, I would never imagine we would be doing. Well, uh, one of the things I will not be talking about all political uh, um, work that is being done. I don't have any photos here of President uh, von der Leyen meeting President Zelensky. You can see it on the news every day. But I, I just wanted to show you things which are happening, which are really happened. This is a, a new program uh, financed 100% by the EU from the repurposed money, from repurposed projects. Uh, implemented by the Energy Efficiency Fund of so-called Vidnovlinia, so uh, e quick, easy repairs of the buildings which were not structurally damaged. Uh, and on the, again, the left-hand side, you can see what was there, I think, in December or November, and then what happened in January. Well, not the best time to do things, but what you have to, what we realized is happening. This is actually city of Irpini, next to Kiev. Yeah, some of you know, it's terrible atrocities happened there. Uh, and despite the situation, despite many buildings being damaged, people returned to their buildings without windows uh, to live there. And of course, the EU came here to help and many buildings are now being done across, uh, and across Ukraine. So a lot of things are happening as regards reconstruction. As I said, uh, my uh, task force has been just closed down to become something bigger. We call it Support Group for Ukraine XXL. Uh, as of 1st of February, we are going to get a lot of extra people, a lot of national experts, maybe from the Netherlands as well, uh, to work with us on the reconstruction. Uh, we're working together with G7+, Plus, with other donors, with EU member states, and of course with the, uh, with the government of Ukraine, but also we are keeping the dialogue with municipalities. This is very important. They will have an important role to play because one of the important, very important reforms which happened and we can be proud of and we should keep it going in Ukraine is the decentralization reform. So I will not have, I am just giving sig signals that I am exceeding my time. I will be here uh, throughout the event, very happy to, to listen to the discussion, joining the discussion and taking some of the recommendations, some of the good ideas back to uh, Brussels uh, because we are just now working on it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And yes, I was giving signals. Yes. I hand over, you moderate the next session, Alexandra. Yeah. Things, uh, since the history showed us that the results of reconstruction actually depends on what has been going on before. That's why we will go back a bit and look what has been going on in Ukraine in the housing sector before the war and what is happening now. And we will start with the Lviv example because this is city, this city that influenced one of the biggest influx of the internally displaced people, IDP. You will hear this term today a lot. Uh, and yeah, let's see how they deal with this situation now. And I would like to give a floor to um, Director of the Urban Development Department of Lviv City Council, Mr. Taras Kopai. Please welcome. Uh, hello, hello. Are you hearing me? Uh, sorry, I can't be with you now. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Andrea and Mrs. Alexandra for invitation and the opportunity to present the city of Liu here today. At first, I want to say that the war brought by the Russian Federation is destroying Ukrainian infrastructure, economic and environment. So not only a hard fight for the victory lies ahead, but also a difficult part of reconstruction. Some territories have already been liberated and uh, under rest restoration now. And the Ukrainian government is working on strategic plans uh, now. Like other cities of Ukraine, we is also working on the development of territory, on improving the quality of housing construction, on land inventory, uh, on the maximally rational use of the community's resources and uh, on the ecological environment of community. Uh, we believe that during the reconstruction of destroyed territories, uh, modern European and worldwide trends should be taken into account. And the experiments of countries which uh, witnessed uh, the war on their territory should be used. Without a doubt, uh, environmental requirements shall be also considered during the reconstruction investigation of subsurface and examination of state of water, etc. Uh, Lviv uh, was the first Ukrainian city which adopted a decision to define uh, requirements for high-quality residential construction, in particular for high-quality special structure, safe living, for example, shelters and security rooms, require requirements for alternative heating, improvement of social engineering, transport and other urban infrastructure. Adab uh, adaptability to the needs of people with disabilities, aesthetic perfection, high quality uh, public spaces, uh, and other. Uh, but um, uh, we also must understand that the uh, issue of territorial reconstruction is different for each region of, of Ukraine. After the liberation of the occupied territories, we will witness, witness a terrible situation. France zoned settlements are particularly wiped off the face of the earth. But at the same time, there are regions in the area such as Lviv, particular. Uh, Lviv is trying to be an active participant in the process of rebuilding of Ukrainian infrastructure. For example, City Council participate in restoration of apartment building in Gustomel, it's a key region bought uh, equipment for the city of Kumpiansk, it's a Kharkiv region, uh, allocated some funds for Sarne, uh, it's a Rivne region. Uh, but uh, Lviv City Council decided to take a slightly different approach to the concept of rebuilding of Ukraine. For, object uh, for objective reasons, we will not be able to be involved in direct uh, reconstruction of the destroyed cities in the east of Ukraine, so we decided to build uh, necessary social rehabilitation and modern infrastructure in our city. Uh, can you switch the photo uh, during I will tell about it? Uh, so it's, uh, so uh, this is unbroken. It's uh, like a, a system of treatment, prosthetics, rehabilitation and humanity. Uh, our hospital has become the main hospital for civilians. We have already started its reconstruction. Uh, the hospital in Bruchovici near Lviv, we also reconstructed and turned into a rehabilitation center. We plan to build, uh, to build new blocks for uh, surgery and rehabilitation, as well as social housing for the patients. Uh, architectural competition for project have already been held uh, for these objects and the winners have been determined. Uh, here, uh, it is uh, worth noting that agreement on the financing of such uh, housing was signed between Lviv and European Commission. It uh, planned to build uh, two complexes, uh, buildings uh, uh, of uh, four, six floors, about uh, 10,000 uh, 400 square meters. Uh, the city proposed territory for these houses and defined the requirements uh, for their construction. The houses will be located uh, not far from the rehabilitation center. 
In this house during rehabilitation should live soldiers, their relatives and wounded uh, civilians. Uh, we have already built the, uh, the broken mothers. Is the center for pregnant women and the women who have just given birth, which came from Eastern Ukraine. Uh, LIV uh, closely cooperates with the government of Ukraine, in particular the program of installing modular houses. It is a program of cooperation be between Ukraine and Poland. It's about uh, 100, 400 people live in LIV. Uh, and, uh, owning to the latest technologies, modern appreciates in architecture, land management, medicine, and social sphere, we are able to create comf comfortable uh, conditions for people who were forced to move to Lviv, uh, who suffered from military action, and for whom the Lviv community has become or can become a new home. And finally, uh, I want to say that. Uh, the combination of efforts of government of Ukraine, local self-government, business, our international partners and every citizen of Ukraine is vital for successful reconstruction of Ukraine. Thank you. You, you can see the presentation till the end. Thank you very much. We will have a bit of time for questions in the end of this blog, and I would like to introduce the next speaker who will talk about the general system, housing system in Ukraine, how it works and what kind of challenges we have there because of uh, disbalanced uh, market proportions of uh, the housing market or the uh, that we also need a bit of more researches on this um, Topic. And I would like to introduce you, Halina, um, Halina Suhomut, who is a researcher on housing policy at New Housing Policy Ukraine, the NGO that aims for identifying social just, just models for housing provision. Please welcome Halina. Thank you very much. Uh, Selena. Um. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to be part of the panel with practitioners in the city dealing with real like problems there. And I would like to give a bit of theoretical overview of what's going on to just provide you better understanding of housing in Ukraine. Uh, so currently, field of housing is one of the biggest challenges of Ukrainian reconstruction of recovery partly because uh, of the Russian war in Ukraine, we have this enormous displacement, like currently more than 5 million people displaced, and the biggest share of total infrastructural damage in Ukraine is in the sphere of housing, how, like residential buildings. And uh, because of this pressing needs to rehouse all these people now, like displaced people, we need to start thinking about housing not in the end of the war, we should start to think about housing right now, because it's extremely complex sphere which depends on so many factors, depends on policies, institutions, um, research and ideas about the housing present in society. Uh, so it's just a general point that housing system in Ukraine is like super home ownership housing system, uh, which results in this disbalanced housing support focused primarily on home ownership and lack of comprehensive approach, which also now led to this fragmentary housing and shelter solutions for the displaced. And we really need to think how to diversify current policy instruments in the sphere of housing. And then just like a short um, couple words that the super home ownership regime, what is this? It's something like characterized but very, very high rate of debt free owner occupancy in Ukraine, which was like around 90% before the war. It's result of this giveaway privatization in 1990s, which led to 
like a lot of the problems, some of the problems that there is this expectations towards the state that everyone will get a free house or apartment from the state directly for free. And then there are unresolved questions after we given these houses for free, who should take care of this housing? And uh, there's like pressure on the government to fulfill this role, to give directly this housing, created this balanced housing support in Ukraine, which is mostly focused on providing either mortgages or giving away apartments for free through so-called apartment key, which was part of Soviet Union distribution of housing, but somehow survived to these days. And like uh, homeowners in Ukraine can also uh, get support for electricity, heating bills and reconstruction. But uh, the problem of it all, the problem is not home ownership per se, and home ownership is very beneficial for many people who can afford it. So it's not a call to go like away to something else. It's a call to diversify instruments of housing because currently accepts the support to homeowners, which is very unjust and inefficient because there was only 41,000 households in 1994 who get these mortgages. Um, but there is very little support for other forms of tenure. For instance, social housing stock like Kiev had only 72 social apartments in 2019. And there is not enough developed temporary housing stock for displaced people. And there is like very unregulated rental market dominated by private landlords and very little support to renters in such situation. And this all leads to this lack of comprehensive approach where there is little understanding where exactly people should live. Because if we try to secure home ownership for, system, for people, it's not the same securing homes. So basically, if there are even now this number of people who cannot have house because their house is destroyed, because it's like young families, there is no clear understanding where sh they should live until they get their houses, until their houses destroyed. And even those families who can't afford buying their own house, they don't have alternatives. Maybe they don't want to have house because of the experience of double loss of home because of the war. Some people moved once already to Bucha, to Irpin, their houses were destroyed and it's not clear whether they want more touch or they, there should be alternatives for such households. And all this focus on home ownership also of the problem in terms of sustainability and quality of living environment, because when the people don't have alternatives, except buying an apartment for them, buying an apartment is so important. It's more important than which kind of apartment is that. So it's basically, you should get something no matter what is that uh, housing. And if some crisis happens, like we have now, there is little policy instruments to deal and respond to this housing urgency. And as we see currently, there are like fragment, only fragmentary housing and shelter solutions for the displaced. And of course, like Ukraine put in now like enormous efforts to deal with this pressures and municipalities doing like great work in a way that they are trying to be very creative to reuse a lot of structures, international organizations and NGOs and volunteers like really involved in this process. But the problem of it, it's also because it's all short-term short and mid-term solutions for shelter. So basically people could live in these containers only for a while, but we don't know where people should live after this like container life becomes very like difficult for people. And because there is like not so much um, solutions, people all also rely a lot on their self-help, their own resources, which are very limited, of course, because of the war, because of what's going on. And like what's happened after, because there is not so much options for people, they, the majority of them, they rely on private rental market and rental accommodations, but we cannot say that it's like long-term solution. It does not mean that 
does not mean that market accommodated people. It because thirty eight percent of displaced households nowadays they already indicate that they don't have sufficient funds to rent this house, and and if they don't have sufficient funds, they need either to leave Ukraine or they need to move back to regions where where their life is in danger. Um, so what we need to do with all of this, uh, like a very important thing would, I would say is to continue doing a research and to evaluate actually what housing means in Ukraine, what people need, how it's connected to migration, how it's connected to sustainability, how it's like what, um, what problems displaced people have and how we should really evaluate demographic trends, um, economic uh, sustainability question. Um, so uh, we just really need to do more research before we can take evidence-based evidence decision. So I would say like really technical assistance in terms of like research collection data is really needed for Ukraine. Um, but there are key questions which we know and we can answer nowadays based on experience of other countries uh, in reconstruction, other countries with super home ownership system, that what should we do to improve situation? We should work with, we should diversify instruments we have. We should like focus not only on home ownership, but also give a chance to other tenures to develop, like cooperative housing, social housing, rental housing. And we need to focus on the most vulnerable households, on the people who don't have where to live at all. Like not that people who have apartments which needs renovations, but people who might die because they don't have where to go in this very difficult war situation post-war development and we need to work as a country, as a like, community of policymakers and researchers, we should walk towards this comprehensive and transparent system in which we can cre clearly answer where different people with different needs, with different uh, economic resources, where they should live and where they will live in the like, future in Ukraine. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kelly. I would uh, remind that we will have a session for question, time for questions after the, uh, this blog. And um, next, I would, we would like to talk about examples that Ukraine already have, because we, actually the war didn't start 24th of January last year. It started in 2014-15 when the Russia invaded uh, Crimea and part of Ukraine, in the east part of Ukraine. And we already have ID, uh, internally displaced people. We already face how it happens, how do they live in containers and that it's temporarily that takes them five years and who knows how much longer. And now we would like to introduce a new speaker who will talk about their experience in Kramatorsk and lessons learned and what can Ukraine do with this experience. I would like to introduce Kornard Klaus uh, from Affordable Housing Program of International Organization for Migration, or IOM. Please welcome. Can you maybe please turn on your microphone? Maybe we can start with the questions while we're fa uh, fixing these technical issues. And luckily, COVID teach us how to deal with uh, mixed uh, conferences these days. Are there any questions to our representatives uh, from Ukraine? Yeah. I'll give a mic to you.
Hi, Ian Morgan with Amapola Capital. I have a question for Halina. I do see the problem you mentioned about 94, 95% home ownership. How do you actually transition to something with a more sustainable ownership level? How do you create the units to fill the gap? What's the path to even make that massive transition? Oh, you have mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's uh, great. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, as my colleague from SEDUS, she will present further that this change and transformation in tenure structure, it's already happened. So we started from this 85, 90% of homeowners, and it's like so much down because of the war. It's, and we need to just deal with this. It's already happened and we should start searching solutions for these people who out of home ownership cannot return there for some reason. And we should like build an instruments like financial instruments, legal instruments, for instance, like building a legal framework for cooperative housing in Ukraine and like searching slow finance or patient finance to like afford this uh, non-profit development in Ukraine. And uh, my colleague from CIDUS, she will present um, more exact uh, for local and public bodies, more exact plan for, for this um, like implementation. So, but thank you very much for paying attention. <laughs> thank you for the comment. Could we hear from you this time? I hope you hear Yes, me. perfect. Great. Welcome. <laughs> From Kiev. I'm really sorry I can't be in the Netherlands. Um, but so, um, yeah, I like, um, thank you for the invitation. And I like to speak a little bit of our experience um, we had working actually on affordable housing um, in Ukraine before the war. So first, um, my name is Konrad Kloos. I am the Shelter and Housing Program Coordinator for uh, the International Organization for Migration in, uh, in Ukraine. And I came to Ukraine in the, I think you have the wrong presentation. Could you have a look at the, yes, one more back. One more back. Yes, there we go. So in 2020, we started to implement a program supporting internally displaced people in Kramatorsk and Severodonetsk um, by uh, the development at 500, of 500 apartments. And um, the system basically would not just um, build from scratch 500 apartments, but also looked into the management of, of the apartment. So we would um, um, work on setting up um, municipal management uh, bodies. And also we, we were looking into how to reinvest um, the money that would um, come in from the rent or from the potential rent to own of these houses. And around this, we, are, we have set up a, a pretty solid team and we actually started construction um, basically in January uh, uh, last year, and then we had to stop it um, as the war started. Um, and the German government was really supportive to uh, transfer the, the funds so we can implement them in, um, in the western parts of Ukraine, inclusive Kiev, um, ivano Frankivsk, Vinitsia, Shenivtsi, Lviv, and Saporizhia. Um, next, next slide, please. So, um, what are the lessons learned? So, the, I mean, the, the speakers before me, they already spoke a little bit about the decentralization and the kind of challenges um, there are with the housing sector in, in Ukraine. And what we, what we definitely see, and that is still um, today a big challenge, is that municipalities are often not really prepared to work, to have international organizations coming in and working on housing programs. And this includes also, for example, land transfer and uh, modalities and the make availability of land 
Um, the repurposing of building and land can be very, very difficult at, at times, and it's not straightforward. Um, then one thing that we, um, we, we, we saw very, very early, and that is also a big challenge, and a challenge um, also the, the, the speaker before me said, is the legislation on, um, for communities, for municipalities, to rent communal property uh, for affordable prices is not really there. And the same uh, is for uh, modalities like a rent for own. So basically um, paying rent for 15 years and then owning the, the, the apartment. It's not there. Um, and then it's the overall capacity of um, uh, communal specialists and municipal specialists to work all through these um, um, hurdles that the uh, Ukrainian legislation has. So how we overcome that is, um, so there needs to be, uh, there's definitely a, a need to establish a clear understanding of what can and what cannot be done. So kind of a playbook, how we can, how we can work uh, together with, um, with administration to establish um, um, communal, communal housing systems. Um, definitely, there is a need to build the capacity of, um, of municipalities and municipal staff. And if I say uh, building capacity, I don't mean that people don't know what they have to do, but it's more the streamlining um, and um, how to do the things in the right way, basically using existing legislation or ever-changing legislation and enable them to implement it. Um, Important also to provide some legal room for flexibility. I mean, there are, there are a lot of things that, for example, cannot be done before the ownership is transferred um, of the land, for example. So you, you, you can't start soil sampling um, on a land plot if you are not the owner of the land plot. And that often, that often goes into delays um, in the construction times and in the delays of implementation. Um, and like really look into the overall legislation um, on the social and affordable housing and see how to rework it and make it more um, suitable for the um, conditions we are facing um, at this moment. Uh, next, please. Um, so what would be the potential role for international support or external support? So one of the things, and this was already started in, in 21, was to, to revise the housing code. And I think there is still quite some work to be done and to streamline it. So and to make it really, to make it clear um, and, and give the room for social housing and affordable housing. Um, that would basically lay the, um, the baseline for it. Um, to assure that um, the environmental and social management guidelines are developed and implemented, um, especially now with the reconstruction. And then I don't want to repeat the build back better, et cetera, et cetera. But there's definitely a lot of room of improvements. Um, with the big number of internally displaced people and people who for a long time will not be able to return to their homes in the East, we really need to think how do we integrate people from, from, from other parts, from the Eastern parts in the country into the Western parts of the country. I know that um, when I speak to municipalities, municipalities themselves are very eager to do so, and they see a lot of um, opportunity uh, with a human capital coming. But we also have the vulnerable communities. We have the uh, we have members, and we have community members that uh, who are in need of protection and additional support. And we have to make sure that we don't leave them behind, or that we are creating. Uh, potential harm in by by integrating or do not integrate people properly in in community. 
I think um, a good opportunity now is to look into the establishment of council estate models um, in Ukraine, uh, managed by municipalities or by municipal enterprises, uh, with hopefully a, a very a low overhead um, and uh, which are flexible and not super, um, not not have a big administrative burden, um, and and also to look how we can see to establish financial instruments for municipalities, so they can use the income for for rent to reinvest. Um, the income from housing into either social infrastructure or to the um, to recovery of housing stocks. Because, I mean, also, as it was um, um, said before, the housing stock in, in, in wide parts of Ukraine was already very tired before the war. And it's not much better now. It's even worse. And um, a lot of a lot of work has to be done. Um, I thank you very much. Um, very open to questions. Um, and um, yeah, I hope uh, you have a, a very successful conference. Thank, thank you. you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, does anybody else have questions to three of our speakers of this panel regarding the current situation in Ukraine? Yes. Um, dear Conrad, my name is Alexander uh, Anisimov. I'm a, a manager of the New Housing Policy Initiative. Um, I wanted to maybe ask you, maybe you could give a few details on uh, how did you foresee the operation model of the housing company you were or were already established in Kramatorsk? Thank you. Yeah, so what we did is. Um, we, we started to work with the municipalities uh, to, estet, to establish a municipal management board uh, body. And, and basically, that is um, a management body responsible, responsible to manage all aspects of around the building newly created. That means uh, selection of um, of renters um, and uh, contract management, um, operation and maintenance. Um, so all the basically all the package, and um, we are very we were very flexible looking in how we are setting it up. But it became evident that we um, the easiest way might be actually to use. Um, 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 a municipal enterprise, while the municipal enterprises sometimes need to be looked into very well, but it's it's a model that 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 might work. Thank you. I would highly encourage you to ask question to our representative from Lviv, since you can catch Halina during the uh, break of, for the coffee. But uh, our guest from Zoom, you can. Use only this moment, only now. So, please do. Yeah. Hello, Julie Lawson. Uh, I have a question regarding um, Lviv. If they could... Um, uh, recently, Lviv received um, uh, 21 million for social housing um, for the city. I'd like uh, if you could, um, Lviv is, is fortunate to have received that. Um, however, how do you see um, a model uh, for future for local governments to be more uh, able financially, fiscally, to be able to play an effective role in the housing promotion of needed homes? Will it rely on gifts, for example, or will there be a sustainable financing arrangement that could support it in the future? Taras, would you need to repeat the question or?
Кажите, можете укрити. Thank you for a question. So it's uh, now is the new um, uh, it's a new experience for the view so uh, such uh, so we don't know at the end uh, this the realization this program so we uh, suppose that uh, in the end of this uh, few months we can uh, Propose a decision of uh, such a such a problem. Okay. Um, since we st luckily still have a bit of time, we are going a bit ahead. It's already here. But she'll be more forward. Okay. Um, but I would say if you still need a bit of time, Taras, and think maybe there is somebody in the audience you could connect later and maybe somebody would, could help you within these months to come up with the, uh, some solutions. Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, you have my contacts so I can and always uh, be ready to speak with all who are interested. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Edwin Buitelaar, uh, urban researcher in the PBL Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency and professor of land and real estate development at Utrecht University. And I have the honor to guide you through the middle section of this program. Uh, but in the meantime, we might uh, have our guest from Ukraine, the deputy minister, who comes and probably uh, interrupts our little program. But I think that will be that will be fine. We just. We just move on now. Um, I think it was very clear now that there is obviously a very urgent need for housing because of everything that has happened in the last uh, couple of months and even even prior to that. But was, what has also become clear, especially in, in Galina's talk, it, is that there is not only a housing availability problem, but there is an affordability problem. And I think the challenge of that is that it does not only require rebuilding homes and rebuilding homes better, but it actually means rebuilding institutions better, governance structures better, legal systems and all of that. Um, and I think that will be the focus of this section when we will talk about securing uh, affordable housing. And we will start with uh, Professor Julie Lawson from RMIT University in Australia and the lead author of Housing 2030, uh, the, the report from the UN. And she will be talking about lots of European experiences and especially the best European experience, experiences, obviously, and the need to combine those experiences to, to help Ukraine. Um, then we will actually go to one of such uh, best examples, at least according to the uh, OECD, the Austrian model is really uh, uh, the, the best practice of uh, not-for-profit housing provision. So I think that's very useful to look at that. And Michaela Kauer from uh, the city of Vienna and um, uh, Veronika Ivanovsky from Vienna Municipal Housing Co uh, Corporation will talk about this, uh, this best practice. And then we go to our last speaker, at least of this block, and before the, the coffee break, uh, Anastasia Bobrova will bring the discussion back to the Ukrainian context and will talk about what is needed to change the uh, Ukrainian system to allow better for not-for-profit housing, for affordable housing. So let me please give the floor first to uh, Julie Lawson. So here I am, finally standing here before you, and I'm very, very pleased to be here and to see so many people and also join so many people online as well. It's incredible turnout. Um, we've got some wonderful speakers, and uh, I'm going to tell you a story which continues uh, our involvement with um, housing reforms and housing futures in Ukraine. Right now, Europe needs to prepare for its role as the key supporter of Ukraine's post-war recovery. A recovery plan can embody important political, cultural and economic values. These values can include things like social solidarity, sustainability, 
social inclusion and reducing poverty. Ukraine is working to define its own approach to build back better, some say, to build forward, say others. And this presentation com contributes to this goal. It draws on the landmark report that's been mentioned of Housing 2030 on tools and best practices in affordable, inclusive and energy efficient housing. This report was initiated by the UN Economic Commission for Europe, which in fact was established after the Marshall Plan in 1947. Also Housing Europe, who's joining us today, which is a federation of public, not-for-profit and social housing organisations, housing tw over 22 million people in, the, in Europe. And also by UN Habitat, which has the mandate of the right to adequate housing. My involvement in drafting this report with Professors Michelle Norris and Professor Holger Volnbaum led to contact with housing policy uh, researchers in Ukraine. And they're here today. I'm very, very happy that Alexander, uh, Anastasia uh, are here because they've come to join us in a conversation. And I'm so looking forward to going to your place and joining you as well. <coughs> this involvement further led to us being involved in the Ukraine Recovery Council's U24 plan. We were both on the uh, working group on housing policy. This pl informed the recovery plan, which was then presented in Lugano. And further input was provided in public forums by our colleague Pavlo Fedorev, for example, at the European Network for Housing Research. And also later at the UNECE uh, had a very important forum on affordable housing as well in September. Together with uh, Zhegoz Gaida, who's at the back of this room from the European Investment Bank, who is a genius with a big heart, we together wrote a, a paper on um, future ideas for capital investment in a housing recovery for Ukraine, which was published in Housing Finance International. Today's work builds on this effort and the collaboration of everybody in this room and beyond for Ukraine, but also from Austria, from Finland, from Denmark, my colleagues across the 56 countries in the UNECE region, and the members of the Roskvik co co coalition also here, represented by Foucault is here, and there are other members as well, which is a coalition of urban uh, practitioners, architects and planners. Moving forward, if I have a clickety-click, We know Europe rebuilt, producing some of the world's most livable cities, but how did it do that? We can learn from history and we can learn from the institutions and funding and the funding flows through those institutions and the capabilities and skills of professionals who were involved in that work. Did you know that when the Marshall Plan was actually being implemented, there were 600 of Christophs in Paris working towards agreements with different countries towards implementing the flow of funds to help with the European Reconstruction Program. But of course, it flowed through existing histories and existing institutions that were there before. It worked with capital investment grants and very long-term loans and a commitment to accelerating the recovery, a political will for a better world. Intergovernmental agreements and grant conditions and these long-term low-interest loans supported a strategic and also stable approach, building homes but also building social solidarity. Best European practices have been maintained in many of these cities, as the members of Housing Europe know. They're still around today. They're still around in Rotterdam. They're still providing, in fact, one in every second dwelling in that city. So there is a key role for for technical assistance 
towards international, uh, with, from international support of the European uh, funds, for example. Did you know that 1% of the Marshall funds were actually spent on technical assistance? 12% went towards low-cost housing. These are figures combined would make an enormous difference to the housing needs of Ukraine. Invest in technical assistance to ensure the institutions and foundations are right so that money can flow to where it's needed in a model which will serve those, this country for future generations. Combined also with capable and purposeful municipal governments and their land policies is the key. But we need to have those national funds and legislation in place for, in order for um, the solutions to be implemented properly. In Austria, that involved several particular funds and legislation. There was a housing reconstruction fund, and there was a federal housing and settlement fund, and later on, a housing Re rehabilitation act. We're going to hear a lot more detail about the Austrian system, so I won't go into detail now. But the important thing is, is that there was a clear division of what these funds were. I mentioned the Housing 2030 report. In there are today's best practices. They cover land policy, financial um, circuits of investment, governance of housing organisations, environmental standards and climate neutrality. This presentation is available online on the Housing 2030 website. Another important lesson that we learned is multi-level governance. Working again, national legislation, allocated funds with an investment mandate, municipal land policies and well-regulated providers. Ukraine has already come to this conclusion itself in its own recovery plan, where it argues for a new concept of social housing, focusing on the supply of non-profit, municipal and cooperative options to address widening needs, and the capacity to plan for these needs, to use its land policies to ensure sites are available, and to revise and expand existing failing, unfortunately, social housing programs that will need revision. We have a fund existing, but it's rather ill-defined for the restoration of destroyed property. It's inadequate. We have existing housing and affordable fund, which has been repurposed for home ownership for the last few years and is de de actually delivered only 72 units in Kiev. It's just incapable and it's been curtailed. It has very limited output. We have also a uh, rental market which is under-regulated and many people are relying on this now, so it's vital that this be um, improved. This is my second last slide. Here I try to outline what are the roles in which uh, the different players could play. It's important that we define them, that we nail them, that we help support their development. It's too hard to read here, so I won't go into it. But the important thing is, is the definition of these roles and a legislative basis and funding to support them. Also, a second message is keeping costs low. Choose your finance, and it, otherwise it will choose you. Make sure that you combine these different instruments, for example, land equity or land leasing, development grants, discounted interest rates, or long-term uh, low-interest loans, for example. They can, in fact, be so effective instruments that you can revolve surpluses after a given time towards the purpose of further substantial renovation and new supply, as Denmark does. These are two examples of, uh, of laws that should be uh, used as good case models. Finally, last slide. An affordable housing recovery plan ship for Ukraine works closely with local and national stakeholders, implements Ukraine's own recovery plan, is guided by the sustainable development goals, informed by best practices, adheres to our energy efficiency directives, inspired by the new European Bauhaus under the guidance of the Ukraine service 
and funded by not only Ukraine itself, but also households who will contribute rents and payments and the very purposeful state investment banks like the EIB, the Council of Europe Bank, the World Bank, the EBRD, and every other purposeful investment bank that can help Ukraine. That's it. Thanks. Thank Thank you very much. And I take over for one minute because if it's okay, the Deputy Minister is now online. Perhaps we can get her on the screen. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear us? Good afternoon. Yes, perfectly well. Uh, we can hear you perfectly. Welcome, Ms. Alexandra Azagina. I hope I pronounce it correctly. You are the Deputy Minister for Communities, Territories and Infrastructure Development of the Ukraine. And I'm very happy that you are willing to give the opening statement, although we already started, sorry for, for that. But we uh, are looking forward for your opening statement and I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The simplified, I think, <laughs> simplified name for our minister is Minister of Restoration. I wish we'll have something like a minister for renaissance because it's, you know, it gives us even more hope for the future. But basically we are dealing with very practical questions. And um, in my short presentation, I would like to focus on the solutions we are developing in the team to build actually transparent tools and make sure that during the restoration, especially in the housings, we will see the only principles build back better, but also market principles that we will uh, avoid any possibilities to have some kind of ghettos of social ghettos when we have, you know, social housings and we will have the involvement of all influencers, all stakeholders, because of course that was something which I heard from the previous uh, speaker as well. Municipalities are the key, but also the rules, that's something which the state needs to provide. So here on this slide, you can see the basic uh, data about the uh, damages. This data uh, includes not everything, but that's very important. This data is based on the applications provided by the people who has their housings damaged or destroyed. They can send the information about this destruction through the application that all Ukrainians has on their phones. It calls DIA. And um, here we are starting with the data gathering. And from our point of view, the data, formalized, verified data, is just the key to all restoration process and especially for the uh, housing. Now uh, we have not only the understanding of what exactly was destroyed and the information from the people, but we are working with the communities to verify this information. And when we are talking about the possibility to compensate to the people, we understand that now we have all register all formal data in one state application so for the people who lost their houses it will be way easier just to you know to send the data and wait when the state will care about their housing can you switch to the next slide so here we see uh, the approach for three types of the destruction routine repair capital repair and totally destroyed houses. For the routine repair, uh, we are planning to use the tool uh, which is called e-support. Uh, uh, it's also based on the application I just mentioned. And here the people can receive the uh, money for the minor repairs, um, which um, we call them marked money. So that means that you're receiving money on your personal account and you can use them only for the raw materials, construction services, and that's all. We already tested the system uh, during the COVID. It was our way to support the vaccination and people who uh, were vaccinated, they had a pos possibility to spend money on a different type of the services, which were also to support the economy. So now we're in discussions with um, UN, uh, because they uh, were first to ask us how we can make the process of the direct support of the people who um, has damaged housings more transparent and more coordinated. Because at the moment there are different donors helping Ukrainians, but sometimes we are overlapping and some you know processes are not so fast. 
So that's the first thing uh, we are focusing now. Here you can see uh, our basic plan for this year. We understand that it's a bit easier to work here with the uh, um, with the private houses because it's one owner and it's really a bit just easy to coordinate. But at the same time, this procedure from our point of view will push people who are living in apartments to be more organized and to also to have their own voice presented in these processes. For us, for the state, of course, we are dealing with uh, uh, people who are owners on the legal base, and that's our way to support them. But in the same time, when we're talking not only about the private apartment, but also about the public spaces here where the municipalities can play a more active role. The second type uh, and the second um, type of the repairs, the capital repairs, of course, it's more difficult, but the approach is nearly the same. So we have a draft law which we hope will be uh, voted in the parliament uh, this month. And this draft law, it, it uh, explains uh, the digital procedure for the compensations to the people who has damaged all um, totally destroyed um, houses and how it works. So um, you made your application through the uh, state application saying like, uh, I have my property damage. Then you send in additional information and it's all connected through digital um, tools when it's proving that you are actually the owner of the property then it's municipality who are checking it was the fact of the destruction really happened or not and then you are not receiving money but you're receiving the virtual certificate which is uh, also connected to your application and you can use this certificate uh, basically in three ways First, you can go and buy on the market something which is already uh, constructed. Um, and it's up to you to choose where you would like to buy this apartment. Even if you lost, for example, your apartment in Mariupol, you can go and buy it in the central part of Ukraine, whatever. That's your choice. Um, the second option, you can be the investor for the, any kind of the new construction and you're just using this um, fund to, to be part of the investment. So it was important for us to make sure that the money goes not to the person, but to the uh, people who are selling the property because uh, before the uh, full-scale invasion, when we had destruction in Donbass, unfortunately we had examples when people were receiving compensations and were just running away and of course it's it's not, you know, helping the state with the possibility to bring people back to Ukraine and actually provide, you know, some push for the economic development. And we're also thinking that it's a way to prevent corruption risks. Uh, the prices. At the moment, um, it will be our minister who is responsible for the calculations of the basic compensation. But we uh, are planning to use the price for the square matter uh, which was before the full scale, uh, scale innovation. That means you cannot ask for the compensation for them, you know, house if you, for example, have very um, valuable paintings or books. It's not possible for us to calculate that and compensate for that, but we can provide a compensation for the square metros. And um, it's important for us that we're starting to do that and making sure that at least some, you know, like a possibility for the people will be available. So having that, uh, it's first of all for the people who lost their apartments. For the people who lost their houses, it's uh, important to provide um, the possibility to receive money, but also in form of marked money. So they will use them only for the uh, repairs or the construction uh, materials. Also, uh, when we are talking about the possibility to um, somehow support people who lost like a multi apartment buildings, it's again about the self organization of the people when they can receive actually better if they are acting not only as individuals, but when they are organizing. And the same it works uh, for them. So the, the key idea here that we as a state, we're using this digital, very transparent tool to make sure that the people will have a choice. At the same time, we understand it's better than um, if the state will start to construct, let's say, like, you know, you know who whole cities or like a part of the cities. First of all, because there's still work going on. And of course, it's hard to plan for such big things. But in the same time, it's to prevent any kind, you know, you know, like a disbalance on the housing market and on the construction market. And we do think that here we, we have more opportunities to be balanced and actually to answer all demands from the people. And um, 
just uh, can you we switch to the next slide and for us of course that's the, we understand that at the moment uh the losses are huge obviously and we understand that we need to act now that's why for us it's uh it's just the question that we need to start with uh, answering for the basic questions like uh, if the people already have uh the heating system working energy system working uh water supply working then we can move to the questions about the housings it's very important to plan right here it's the same related to the logistics but even more important we are considering the questions of the housings together with the questions of the working places and the business environment because of course a lot of businesses left the country a lot of businesses were relocated and we understand that those two things like planning for the reconstruction and actually like a business opportunities they need to go together and uh for us it's also the last thing i would like to uh, emphasize like when we were looking for the solutions we built this one it's digital based it's I, i think quite like a good for the prevention of the corruption it's not answering the big questions about the totally destroyed cities i think that's something we will need uh, to answer a bit further and in the same time we understand that uh here uh, we will need to work first of all with the people uh with the people and their basic needs the things will change after our victory and the most important message i would like to send that this methodology and this digital tool to uh, compensate people through the virtual certificate it will start with the arrested russian assets so we already have some like a 550 million uh, dollars in in ukrainian budget which was you know, arrested russian assets and we would like to use them already this year and when we will show to the world community that this tool is efficient it's working we will invite other partners who has you know like a russian assets arrested russian assets to become the part of this project and also help ukrainians to receive their compensation faster even before the victory and whole uh, reparation process starts thank you very much that's all for my point and i'll just will be very happy to cooperate with everyone in the panel and this event thank you for having me Thank you very much. And um we go back yes. to your session. <laughs> yeah, let's go back to the affordable uh, home session and uh, let's go straight to our next two uh, speakers, uh, Mikhail Lakauer, head of the Brussels office of the City of Vienna, and Veronika Ivanovsky from Vienna Municipal Housing Council or Corporation. Company. 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 Oh, also good. <laughs> Um, thanks a lot for the invite and congratulations to all those who contributed to make this conference possible online and offline. And um, let me first express my, my admiration of all the, for all the Ukrainian friends and the minister who just spoke for the work they are doing. And I share, of course, the hope for peace soon because then we can start doing what we're all about to think about here thinking about how can we have affordable and social housing in the ukraine so we are here from from vienna basically and trying to explain a little bit what uh, the magic of the vienna model is um we are happy to do that and we will also try not to disappoint you with the fact that we are doing this since 100 years uh so for all those who want to copy it uh it's not that easy of course because it took it quite a while to build it up but i think that some of the qualities that we have found out to be successful in vienna this is something we would like to share today with you so i have with me veronika ivanovsky she's quite new in the municipal housing company of vienna and veronika you can say yourself what you're doing Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having the opportunity to speak here. My name is Veronika Ivanovsky and I'm working for Wiener Wohnen, Vienna's municipal housing company. And we are the largest manager of municipal housing complexes in Europe, managing 220,000 apartments in 1,800 complexes. Yeah, and maybe we start with the first. Yeah. So we have close to 2 million people living in Vienna at the moment and we just add on that a quarter of them nearly is living in municipal housing 
and about half of them, 900,000 in total, is living in municipal, cooperative, or some in some other form of subsidized housing. So just to give you uh, an idea about the numbers, which already illustrate a little bit uh, the fact that Julie was talking so beautifully about, the social solidarity. Nobody is stigmatized in Vienna because he or she lives in social, municipal, or public housing. Uh, with regard to uh, the Austrian model that has al already been mentioned, I think the, one of the be best lessons to learn from Austria is that we have this very strong national legislation about housing is something that is, has to serve the common good. And that's very important because it recognizes the fact that the market doesn't regulate uh, affordable housing solutions so well. Let's put it a little bit more diplomatically here. Um, but the idea is that if you, if you establish housing schemes, you need to have in mind the priorities that it has to serve the common good. And the, so the common good has to do with economic, ecological, social sustainability. Uh, and of course, uh, if you look at the field of the United Nations, also cultural adequacy. But it at last is a, this has led to a system where we are, uh, we are close to 119 cooperatives, housing associations, uh, many of them member of Housing Europe who are present here as well. Uh, we have these all over the country in all our nine provinces. And we ha it has already been mentioned, uh, I think, earlier, the OECD has recognized the Austrian model as something that is worth to look at by other countries who are trying to do something about their housing systems. And it also is important maybe to know, because we have been talking about municipalities already, to explain a little bit how we can do this on local level, how, we, how this kind of translates to the local level. Veronica. Um, so... On the regional level, we have the housing construction promotion that is being regulated by nine different housing construction promotion acts. And in Vienna, we have the Vienna Housing Promotion and Housing Rehabilitation Act. And this act regulates the subsidization of the construction of new housing as well as the renovation of older houses. And what it also does is it determines the type and extent of support that is granted to housing developers by, for example, low interest loans and it regulates the benefits that are dispersed to tenants. And now let's have a look at how affordable housing in Vienna is financed. So the subsidies for affordable housing are financed from federal taxes through the general income tax system. And this funding through taxation creates a reliable basis for the planning of complex housing programs, which would be impossible under strictly market-dependent policies. So the funding of social housing construction is tied to a fixed portion of income tax, the so-called housing promotion contribution, where the quota is regulated by a federal law and amounts to 0.5% of the gross pay of employers and the gross income of employees. And on the basis of this tax, Vienna receives an annual amount of 250 million euro per year for housing construction purposes. But as you can see on the slide, we invest way more into housing, namely almost 450 million. And this is because Vienna grants favorable loans to limited profit providers, which then repay those loans, and thus a self-revolving system is created. And we also differentiate between subject funding and object funding, as you can see on the slide. So object funding basically means the funding of new construction and renovation. With this budget every year, around 6,000 new apartments are built and 4,000 refurbished on average. And subject funding is the direct financial support of people who are unable to afford even subsidized rents. And as you can see, we invest way more into object funding than into subject funding because we strongly believe that it is better to proactively invest money into the construction of new homes rather than reactively invest money into the symptoms, to treat the symptoms of extreme social inequality. So in Vienna, we have this large offer of affordable apartments. We have 220,000 municipal apartments and 200,000 subsidized apartments. And these 400,000, 420,000 affordable apartments have a price dampening effect on the entire residential market. So if we look at the rents in the municipal sector, we have a benchmark rent of six euro and 15 cent. And this benchmark rent is set in national legislation and the rents develop only in line with the consumer price index, which prevents price surges. 
In the subsidized sector, on the other hand, the rent is approximately €6.60. Here, the tenants may have to pay an equity contribution to cover the costs for construction and land. And on the private market, we have rents of €10 Euro and 50 cents, but in many locations, they are way higher. And here, tenants can also be confronted with location surcharges or limited land rental contracts. Whereas in the municipal and in the subsidized sector, the rental contracts are always unlimited. And in order to access the sector, the income cannot be more than the income thresholds allow. And these income thresholds apply for both the municipal and for the subsidized sector. And we have quite high income thresholds because we want to have the middle income earners to have access to our subsidized and municipal housing as well. So as you can see, 75% of the VINIs are actually eligible. And this is because our housing policy is directed in its social political function to practically all groups of the population, because we have to focus on achieving a social mix. And the effect of that is, is that we have no stigmatization tendencies or dangerous neighborhoods in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And with regard to our concept of social mix, which is in fact one of the main aims of the Viennese housing model. You can also see already this picture, I think is always very, very clear. We are, we are having those municipal housing buildings all over the city. There is no territorial segregation on top of we are avoiding social and economic segregation in Vienna. So I think that this is something that is very, very important and we have uh, more differentiated also instruments to control the use of land in Vienna. And I'm giving back the word to Veronique. Thank you. So um, as we know that in recent years, the land and real estate prices in many European cities have spiraled out of control. And to counteract this development, the city of Vienna amended its building code and introduced the subsidized housing zoning category. So this basically means that on plots that are classified as belonging to this category, two-thirds of the usable floor space needs to be reserved for subsidized housing. And it is important to mention in that context that the city doesn't sell the land to the providers, but we lease it on the basis of long-term lease contracts. And also there is no intervention in existing dedications and existing property. And also the category is linked to a sales span, so the city would have to approve the sale of these apartments. And for the land procurement, we have our Wohnfonds Wien, which is Vienna's land provision and urban renewal company that right now own 3.1 million square meters of land. Which is another way, of course, to control the use of building ground in our city. And we're coming to our last remarks. Uh, we think that parts of the model are, of course, very local, typical, embedded in the Vienna tradition. But what we think that what we can learn from and what we would like to share also is that in Vienna, we can rely on a very stable legal framework, both on national and on local level, that the municipality is empowered to do its own housing policy. With, with, but in, it's in a framework of a housing policy that is aiming at the common good and at the social mix. We are committed to long-term planning and that also uh, requires long-term financing models. So we are, we are happy to have boring financial financing models rather than fast, volatile, profit-oriented financing models in the housing sectors because we think that this is better for the people. We are, of course, trying to have a system where we protect people's needs, but also give them a voice. I think little has been said at the moment still about tenants' protection, tenants' empowerment, and, of course, uh, participation in all the projects. And I think this is also something that uh, Ukrainian experts here will are a guarantee for, that making people participate in what you are trying to reconstruct and build back uh, is really, really important. But also allowing for strong tenants' unions, strong tenants' protection is something that is vital in a Good for, for good governance in, in social housing policies. Thank you so much. And we're happy to share some documents outside also for you. Well, thank you very much for sharing this fascinating uh, atypical extreme case, I think, in, in Europe, which is very, very interesting. Not just for Ukraine, but also for the Netherlands, I guess. Um, 
So let's go back to Ukraine, uh, to Anastasia Bobrova. She is a senior housing policy analyst at CEDOS, and CEDOS is an independent think tank in Ukraine that works on social development. The floor is yours. Yeah, Edwin, thank you for the introduction, and it is an honor for me to be here to share this floor with such wonderful speakers from abroad and, and from Ukraine as well. And here I represent Ukrainian Kyiv-based think tank, Center for Society Research, CEDOS for short. We do research, policy analysis, we also organize events, we organize Ukrainian Urban Forum, which will happen this year in July, and we are working on the program, and you will be invited for this soon. And here I am about to talk what has been happening with Ukrainian housing ecosystem during the war. And most importantly, I am also about to speak about solutions, because I think it is crucial to focus right now on solutions, what new approaches we can take to our housing policy in Ukraine, how can we rethink our housing policy and renew this. I am going to outline some tendencies that we see from our research and from our analysis. And the first one is that is rather this general tendency in Ukrainian housing policy, and our po housing policy is fragmented. We have different stakeholders involved in Ukrainian housing policy. However, we still lack the institution that will be able to develop this coherent strategy for housing policy renewal. And unfortunately, within this complicated system, social housing remains marginalized in Ukraine. Another thing is that during the war over the last year in Ukraine, housing needs not only increased, but diversified. We have this growing need for emergency temporary accommodation. On the other hand, we also have this growing need for long-term rental affordable housing. Why am I saying this? Because housing tenure structure is Ukraine, is, in Ukraine is already changing. Here you may, may see some numbers from 2019, you may see here that the share of homeowners was rather high, the share of tenants in the private rental sector was rather limited, only 8% of people. However, right now, this, this is the data from October 2022, we already see some trends that the share of homeowners is decreasing in Ukraine. Simultaneously, the share of tenants in the private rental sector is increasing. This is happening because of the destruction, this is happening because of the displacement, and we, we think that this trend will remain with us and uh, the share of tenants in the private rental sector will increase because the majority of internally displaced people are right now housed by the private rental sector, even though private rental sector remains widely unregulated and the tenants' rights are not, like, are not protected in a very good way. Another thing is that housing is becoming unaffordable for a significant share of the population. Right now, we are in the midst of an economic crisis. We see that the unemployment rate is growing, real incomes of the households are decreasing, and households are exhausting also their savings. Here, you may see some, per some numbers for the housing costs. And already in October in 2022, 26% of people spent between 30 and 50% of household monthly income on housing. At the same time, 17% were spending more than half of their household monthly income on housing. This means that many households found themselves in the situation where housing costs became a burden for them already. And the situation is even worse for the representatives of vulnerable social groups, for those who lost their homes, for internally displaced people, for low-income households. At least 39% of internally displaced people now claim that they need assistance with paying rent. However, the major governmental programs that we have right now mortgage schemes or concessional loans programs, those programs are not able to cater for these different needs of different social groups that we now have in Ukraine. People find themselves in the situation when they cannot afford to take a loan, they can also not afford to be homeowners in the future, to repair, to maintain their buildings. Only 27 percent of people claim that they would consider applying for mortgage or for a concessional loan to improve their housing conditions. All of these things bring us to a conclusion that this need for secure municipal rental housing, this need is very high and this need continues to grow. The second part of my presentation I want to dedicate to discussing some possible solutions, and possible new approaches that we have. Already previous speakers were talking a lot about this 
need for a legal framework, for a comprehensive legal framework. And there are a couple of entry points right now in Ukraine, a couple of processes that we can mention and we can use to outline this legal framework. The first one I want to mention is the social code. In 2023, Ministry of Social Policy plans to renew social code, which will have separate section on social housing in Ukraine. This might be the document that will help to outline this legal framework on the national level for Ukraine. And this is, is going to be the document which will state very clearly this need for social rental housing. Another thing that's been already mentioned here today is this National Recovery Plan project, which was developed last year by the government together with non-governmental organizations. Our organization was also a part of this task force, task force working on the National Recovery Plan. And this document sets a task to create this bill for non-profit housing provision. And it also might be this another entry point on how can we motivate national institutions to work on social housing, on rental housing. Okay, so in conclusion, what do we need on a national level? Very important thing, we need this legal framework. We need to have unified social housing fund and we need to have unified social housing queue. As of now, we have two different housing funds that resemble social housing and that they basically serve the same purpose, to house vulnerable social groups. We also have three separate housing queues, and it creates this additional administrative burden on the municipalities to manage those housing, different housing queues. It also creates further challenges for assessing the need for social housing. Another thing is that we need a strong institution capable of developing a coherent strategy for housing policy. Right now, we see that maybe social housing is going to be marginalized. And it is important that we bring the Ministry of Recovery back into discussion about social housing and that social housing will become a part of this coherent national recovery strategy. We also need investment in research to understand the needs of the households and to build policy solutions based on this. It goes without saying, we still need to learn a lot about the difficulties that households encounter on their past phase of housing past phase in Ukraine. On the local level, what do we need is, of course, we need municipal housing companies that will be able to take responsibility for public housing and manage this housing in a long-term perspective and to be able to operate it and to maintain it. And for this, we also need capacity building activities. We need, to need, we need some peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange, consulting, expert support for municipality. We also need to present them with these best practice solutions and try to transfer those solutions to Ukraine. However, we also need to talk with municipalities and to understand Ukrainian context and the challenges that they encounter. And I want to wrap up this presentation by saying that it is crucial right now to support civil society in Ukraine because we are the drivers of the future change. Ukrainian civil society organizations are behind many progressive reforms that are happening now in Ukraine. And we are here, we are present, we are ready to cooperate, we are ready to discuss because any solutions that we will have in the future, those solutions have to be locally specific and they have to account for Ukrainian voices. And yeah. <laughs> An ounce of coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anastasia. We are, small surprise, a little bit behind schedule, not much. Uh, so I, I think we should use the time for just one question, one very clear and specific question. No statements. Nobody. Uh, then, oh, yeah, you. Do you still, is it still working? Still working, yeah. I have a question to our guests from Vienna. I assume you've been traveling a lot and giving this kind of presentation quite often. The question is how often you feel like it's landed and that, it's, that uh, the audience used the information that you use and what, what was the factor why it happened? <laughs> yeah, if you want, please. to share the different qualities, as I mentioned. So use the fact that land control is important, and we see in many places now that we have a zoning law, like in Vienna, is maybe not possible in every city, but you can have community, uh, community land trusts, 
uh, you can have other forms to long-term lease uh, for, for your building ground. So using the, 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 I mean, different instruments to achieve the goal, I think this is what we are talking about when we exchange with other cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the good thing of such a packed program is that a coffee break is really, really well deserved. <laughs> um, so we take half an hour for some drinks, some refreshment, and talks, obviously. So back in half an hour. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we will continue. So please, uh, please take your seats. <laughs> Please sit down. Um, I think uh, before the break, uh, the Deputy Minister made a very important point, and she said that uh, homes do not sit on themselves. They should be integrated or being part of an integrated approach uh, to urban development. And I think that that's exactly what we're going to discuss in this block. So, uh, homes do not stand on their own, they are embedded within, hopefully, good places and, and good neighbourhoods. And, and how do you create those? Well, we have a very uh, appropriate person to talk to us about that first, uh, Francesco Veenstra. He is the, I have to look it up in English, uh, the Chief Government Architect, the Rijksbouwmeester. Um, and he will talk about, uh, well, urban designs for livable, uh, livable neighborhoods. Um, urban design is obviously important, but how do you institutionalize that? How do you organize an integrated approach? And one best practice from another country is from, from Finland, and Jarmo Linden will talk about how housing finance is connected to infrastructure provision in Finland. So I think that's a very interesting case of how you can combine different land uses financially, institutionally. And then again, we will uh, bring, it back to, uh, bring it back to Ukraine and uh, Alexander Anisimov will talk about what challenges there are for spatial planning and land policy uh, in Ukraine, because we are now moving further towards the field of urban design and spatial planning, I feel. So not just housing provision, we have a slightly broader scope in this part of the program. So may I first give the floor to you, Francisco. Thank you. Especially after my um, uh, former speakers, it's really um, necessary to be a little bit uh, modest. Um, especially after the uh, example, I, I did know the example of Vienna, uh, but I was in a housing debate in the Netherlands on Monday, uh, where we really can't solve the issue the way you did. So. Um, that's on one side. On the other side, how the um, uh, central government of the Ukraine is dealing with um, uh, trying to find solutions of uh, direct um, um, response to the, to the needs of, uh, of new homes. And uh, one of the other projects I'm uh, working on here in the Netherlands is the earthquake area in Groningen, in the northeast of, uh, of the Netherlands. Uh, where we're still, um, uh, after more than 10 years of the last major earthquake, are in a situation where we can't really handle uh, the situation and, and solving the problems for the people. Um, yeah, since my contribution is more of a statement, I will uh, read it out for you, but based uh, on uh, or um, uh, guided by some of the images, as you can see here. So uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, symposium, I think, which is really uh, relevant. In May 2022, uh, I've been asked by the Dutch government to reflect on the Dutch contribution uh, to the enormous recovery of the Ukraine built environment. I've stated that our contribution should be useful and also based on the local needs. We also need to retain humble and providing our support through a European organized principle of collaboration. This image is created by my favorite artist. Uh, acting on a thin line of fear and hope uh, is where we all are now at this moment and with the hopeful perspective to a better future. It also illustrates in an extreme way the need for a quick, safe and future-proof recovery of the Ukrainian villages and cities and above all, the recovery of the Ukrainian society. 
Uh, I'm representing the Institute of the uh, Chief Government Architect, uh, as announced, and together with uh, a large group of over 40 professionals in the field of spatial planning, we contribute to the further living environment, uh, to the, uh, further living environment of our country. We advise our central government and we focus on the improvement of our shared spaces, bridging disciplines, connecting the variety of interests, using the power of creativity and the visual and verbal imagination, acting in the field of architecture, urbanism and landscape design. Uh, and it was already said uh, before, building back better. It's something we do here in the Netherlands. And, and again, I think we can also learn from you. We should learn from you. The easy way uh, for me to contribute here is um, to just simply show you the projects we are working on and, and the goals and the local goals here in the Netherlands, such as the development of a new uh, European construction culture, bio-based and nature-inclusive design and construction. It's based on the foundation of the new European Bauhaus, which we um, encouraged here also in the Netherlands to embrace. Our focus on the production of nearly a million homes over the next 10 years, uh, and um, half of those ha uh, homes uh, to be affordable. Or the implementation of sustainability targets uh, to our new buildings and the existing 8 million homes in the Netherlands. Uh, based on various conversations with Ukrainian people working in the field of architecture and spatial planning, today I will focus on the public domain. Spaces for people to meet and to reconnect to their families and friends, to their neighborhoods and cities and to their cultural backgrounds. Spaces where people can feel safe again and spaces that reflect a prosperous future. One of the instruments uh, we use as an institute is to work alongside researchers and spatial planners to explore and develop safe environments. This is an example of our initiative Home Away From Home, which we initiated in 2016. The initiative addresses the need for safe, temporary housing facilities that find their base in the balance between uh, private and collective spaces and where quality of the living environment is non-negotiable. Principles of this research by design study are now being implemented in the development of temporary housing facilities across the Netherlands to facilitate Ukrainian refugees and also refugees from other countries across the world. Um, it was the first lady of Ukraine who raised the need for involvement of the architects and builders to create space around people creating obstacle-free neighborhoods for people to return to and to pick up their lives living, uh, to pick up their lives and building their societies. It is this call to action that I believe should be picked up by the International Society of Architects, Planners and Landscape Architects and where we as a Dutch National Institute should contribute to. Bringing back livable cities to all residents in the Ukraine adopting to people's limitations and reinforce their strengths, providing a safe and healthy place for those who are in need of physical and mental care now and for many years to come, rethinking the infrastructure that should allow people to move and without obstacles, creating an inclusive public domain. It's easier said than done, of course, but holding on to the optimistic perspective of an artist is what I am wishing you all. Uh, sadly enough, the war is not over yet, but the signs of the recovery and the stronger Ukraine society are there. A hopeful prospect. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this for this different perspective, slightly different uh, uh, angle for the next presentation, but uh, no less important. Um, I think what we also have to think about is how do we bring all these different functions together in neighborhoods and cities? And that is about bringing together different funds, different financial streams, different institutions. And uh, a very good example of that uh, exists already. Um, it exists in Finland and it will be presented by Jarmo Linden, and he is the director of Housing Finance and Development Center, 
ARA in Finland, which is an organization that exists since the Second World War and provides a lot of housing subsidies in Finland. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, is it here? Yeah. So, 10 minutes. <laughs> You know, I come from Finland, which is uh, the world's happiest country, which I doubt a lot. It's uh, five and a half million people, but a huge country, the northernmost member state of European Union, and until Ukraine is a member of EU, the not easternmost as well. You look at the map. Yes, Finland was much, much larger, but it, got, it was minimized in the Second World War, and that caused a huge housing shortage at that time. And that was one reason why our agency was established to solve temporary housing shortage, which we are doing <laughs> every day, <laughs> all over these decades. But we have delivered something over 1.1 million homes over these years, first concentrating on home ownership, and now in the European Union concentrating on social housing. We went out of the forest in the 60s, 70s to the cities. That's the urbanization there. <laughs> so we are a government agency uh, operating under the Ministry of Environment. I don't go through those tasks. So from the national uh, budget accepted by the parliament, we get mandate to accept loans, 2.3 billion euros and grants, 360 million euros this year. A lot of energy efficiency grants, for instance. But yes, uh, it doesn't help anything if the government is planning to do something if there is no cooperation with the municipalities. So we have developed this type of agreement uh, procedure with the biggest uh, urban areas, the seven biggest. It scatters over half of the population. The agreements concern land use, housing and transport. And the valid adieu, added value of these agreements you know that the municipalities, they tend to sub-optimize and they, they try to compete to get the best taxpayers to their municipality. To, um, not to do that. That, that, there has to be cooperation between the municipalities in the same uh, working and living area. Uh, and, uh, and coordinate the land use, housing and transport together. And the government, that's the other point, that the, the municipalities make a deal with the government so to promote these uh, common goods ideas on that area. The most important is, of course, the capital area of Helsinki. Uh, it's a city of 660,000 inhabitants, but the whole area is about 1.2 million inhabitants. The idea is to build 66,000 new dwellings, which about over one quarter is social housing. So we promote not only this housing, but we also give to the municipalities infrastructure grants and the government. Uh, co-finance the important collective and other uh, transport systems. So municipalities promise to give land for social housing and government promises to support housing production and co-finance this transport system. So the idea is to get some kind of win-win situation. And in the Helsinki region, when we started this 15 years ago, the housing production is, was a level of six, 7,000 new homes per year. Now it's up to almost 20,000 apartments. And the social housing production has been according to the plan as well. Maybe not totally, but almost. So in the Finnish system, this affordable housing 
is achieved with this government uh, guaranteed and subsidized loan, loans and the cooperation between the municipalities that they promise to give these uh, affordable building sites in Helsinki region. It's usually about 30% lower than the market price. And the rents, they are cost-based, not market rents, and the city of Helsinki, these uh, uh, government-subsidized rental homes have about 60% uh, lower rents than market level. I would like to underline that to get the good system of housing, you need both supply side and demand side subsidies. You can't trust on, on, on demand side subsidies only. You need the structure of housing and, as well. And who are the owners? There I, I noticed that uh, one representative from Ukraine already underlined the importance of municipality-owned housing companies and they are ma our main clients. <clears throat> the biggest one is the, owned by the city of Helsinki, which has over 50,000 homes. But it's open, the system is open to others as well, non-profit organizations who promise to follow the rules of the game. We are, of course, monitoring them. You never trust anybody. <laughs> <laughs> for student housing, elderly housing, for instance, and for disabled people, we have made a lot of, uh, we have subsidized a lot of homes for them. Helsinki City, it's based like in Vienna for social mix since at least 50 years. I think that's the basis for that uh, there are balanced housing areas. This year they have target to <coughs> make possible the construction of 8,000 new homes, 30% for social housing, 20% in the middle, and 50% and non-regulated, owner-occupied or rental housing. And new residential areas, they, 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 this is social mix in practice, so because the la uh, city owns most of the land, it can, uh, <coughs> it can design the rules of the game, giving the uh, balanced, uh, uh, giving out the building sites so, that, so it's balanced between social housing, affordable housing and non-regulated housing. And they are not selling land anymore, as only sometimes. <laughs> But general rule, don't sell the land if you own it. <laughs> so we have, we have given uh, infrastructure uh, grant also to develop that area as well, to build uh, parks and roads inside in common. Okay, summary, you need this National Housing Agency, uh, municipal land policy, and municipal housing companies are very important. And then th there has to be cooperation organized on the government level and municipal level so that both can win. I think that's all. Um, it takes time. 2003, I was uh, planting an oak with the president of Republic at the time. <laughs> and I went to see the oak. <laughs> it takes time to grow and grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jarmo. Uh, well, back to Ukraine uh, again. And our, our next speaker is uh, Alexander Anisimov. He is from New Housing Policy Ukraine, and he is also a co-organizer of this conference, a very committed young researcher. So, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me here, and I'm really glad to see so many uh, people in this uh, place today. Um, essentially continuing uh, the discussion about institutions um, and also referring back to the talks we had uh, earlier this day, uh, I would think about you know the aspect where it all takes place, actually space, uh, essentially uh, because housing reconstruction takes place in space. And my question would be is that 
if or whether Ukrainian spatial planning is actually ready uh, to uh, recover Ukrainian cities. Um, and what we had um, was this kind of classical uh, greenfield development. Um, since Soviet times, uh, we had this idea of um, easy and you know, uh, vacant land development, which actually continued out uh, since you know, Soviet Union was no more. And we have all of these classical problems. They're very classical, right? We don't have social mix. We don't have proper public transportation. We don't have uh, proper climate adaptation tools and all of the things that come together. And they were all present and they were not enforced. Uh, the question is uh, whether we will not or whether we will follow the same path into uh, recovery. Um, just one thought before we jump in the into the discussion about the tools we need is that there is nobody uh, that I've heard about and I've talked to who has a vision of the spatial planning system we need in Ukraine. So there are patchy laws and the recent one was adopted in 2020, um, which kind of merges a lot of things and is good in a way, but it is very technical and it actually is an update on the earlier system. And this update did not um, properly offer a vision of how should cities plan themselves, uh, how those territories um, enforce their visions about good life. But still, municipalities are responsible. So that is written in every law and constitution. The municipalities are responsible for, for spatial planning. To recover Ukraine, uh, even without having that vision, <laughs> uh, we need to tackle three more practical things. Uh, in my opinion. So the first thing is the housing needs that we've been talking all, uh, over this day are not reflected in planning, uh, and you'll explain you how. Um, then we actually lack the planning tools for redevelopment of the existing territories that uh, we've seen damaged or destroyed or even those standing. And the last but not the least is that the legislation for recovery itself um, is very confusing and municipalities not know the priorities and where to invest time and money in the recovery process. So first things are this inconsistencies about how we ask questions and what questions are asked when we talk about planning and we talk about housing, right? When we talk about housing, we talk about tenure, we talk about ownership structures, we talk about affordability. And when we talk about spatial planning, we kind of put those questions aside. We talk about, you know, quality public space, we talk about availability of social infrastructure, you know, availability of some, you know, necessary densities and something else. But those questions kind of do not come together. Um, and the problem is that in the end, we uh, are missing all of those housing requirements that were talked about that are present in Vienna, that are present in Finland, that are present elsewhere in also here uh, in the Netherlands. And we have to develop those tools which are not present in Ukraine at any legal level municipalities are not able to enforce housing uh, policies or housing aims uh, in their planning documentation. They are not just allowed by law. In a sense, we have to revamp the existing law system according to new principles and the ways we want to shape social housing in, in the country. Um, I want also to kind of complement this discussion is that that, it, that really matters. It's not just that, you know, it's good to do that or it's nice to have it, but one thing, on the one hand, we would have, you know, security of donor investments when we have, you know, proper planning documentation for recovery with housing aims and um, all of the contracts involving, you know, the goals and the percentages we want. Or we would have, you know, those classical inability to constantly inability to meet those social housing goals that were put together by donors or by national government or by anybody else. The other thing that will be haunting us uh, in the recovery process is the um, issue of the lot of housing stock that is overlooked. So 60, over 60% 60 of the housing stocks is in a way outdated because it was not modernized uh, since it was built and it was mainly built in the Soviet times with you know, mediocre quality of construction. It was also lacking uh, enough uh, social infrastructure for our contemporary needs and so on. Uh, but it's also problematic, as Galina ha has accentuated, that we have those 
you know, disrupted ownership structures. It's very hard to bring people together to, uh, to, to make things work. And it's just also, also sad that there are some good initiatives on the local level, how people come together and, you know, uh, get loans and invest. But that's not the scale we are talking about. In Lithuania, they calculated that with the recent scale uh, of renovation, they will be able to renovate housing until 2112, right? I don't think we have that time. No problem. And essentially, uh, having those you know, uh, things together, um, we want to have things like this, right, in Ukraine when we recover. We don't want to have this, you know, problems, uh, you know, with those uh, ghettos, as Alexandra told today, right? We want to have livable um, neighborhoods. Out of those we had earlier, or those who became, which became outdated uh, since they were built. But essentially, uh, we don't have the capacities and the policy tools. And I'm talking about legislation first. We have to develop those planning and development instruments for Ukraine or to adapt those exist elsewhere that can help the municipalities to design and redevelop those neighborhoods and those micro rayons built in Soviet times. There have to be this shift of ownership structure that follows an effective process in project management that's been talked already. But what I want to focus you is that we have to have this legislative change in the core of the system that allows municipalities to bring uh, those investments from donors and those interests for development together. And that's again what I was accentuating is that it's not just that that's the problem of some municipalities, but either we meet those aims of a green, new green deal with Ukrainian recovery or we do not. Either we come together uh, to a point where we have zero net emissions from housing or we continue to subsidize it. This is a crucial question about recovery. Um, and the third point that has been a little bit missing in the previous discussions is that Ukrainian recovery won't be, you know, one way streamlined, but so far it has been very chaotic. And one of the reasons for that is that national government has not yet managed to find a suitable hierarchy and a suitable logic of strategic plans to help municipalities to recover. And I'm not talking just about municipalities that were damaged, but also for municipalities that were in the hinterlands of the war helping uh, the front. And essentially what is here is that um, what you see on the slide actually is that most of the municipalities that participated in a survey in 2020, um, you know, had just very basic like socioeconomic data on their, in their hands. They didn't have spatial plan. They didn't have a development strategy. They didn't have a land use scheme. They didn't have investment passports. So they were lacking very basic strategic documents to develop further. And this is crucial because in 2020, then there was this merger of digital cadastres with the spatial documentation, which requires immense effort on behalf of municipality to provide actually basis for future development. And then even more in 2022, national government introduced program of comprehensive recovery for those municipalities that were affected by the war. Essentially, the question is, how does the national government expect municipalities to cope with it? That's, that's the reason. And I'm asking with this evidence available, um, and I also very much invite you to read the OECD report on Ukraine, which is an immense value uh, on, on recovery using the regions and the local um, authorities. So essentially what needs to be done is the merger of those strategic documents to assist municipalities. Uh, that is the, ch the challenge for national level legislation, uh, for the legislative body and for the cabinet of ministers. We actually have to push for international knowledge sharing on those qualified personnel to be able to uh, cater uh, for those strategic document development. And we also have to streamline those practices. We have to, have to make them unified and simple to develop and equally able, able to compare it uh, between each other. And again, again, that is not just me wanting to discuss these things with you, but it is crucial because one hand we will have desynchronized spatial and economic development projects that wump up on greenfield somewhere in the space which do not reflect uh, the needs of municipalities, or we will have a synchronized and legal convergent uh, system for donors and for Ukrainian government to invest properly, as the Finland does, in the recovery with the infrastructure and all the social housing that is required. So my kind of message here would be that you, 
maybe representing not just the EU, but all of the partners and interested parties uh, in this whole, um, that there is a need for three points or three areas of work uh, together. And if on the Ukrainian side, we have to introduce those housing requirements and planning and to actually allow municipalities to plan for housing uh, and to require that. Um, on the partner side, it is very important that we introduce the most advanced, the most socially responsible and equitable legislation, not just the one uh, that is more, you know, catering for the market needs. Then there is about the redevelopment of those old housing stock and the uh, partners have to assist in devising those programs based on their experience, based on their local knowledge gained in their practice elsewhere, and to come to Ukraine and share those knowledge with municipalities. And Ukraine obviously has to work properly on introducing those uh, legislative opportunities and streamlined development practices of how we go for, for a region or for a district or somewhere and get from the state it is, from those dilapidating old housing stock to somewhere we want to live and somewhere people want to get back to their work. And the third thing which has been, you know, uh, talked about earlier today, but I cannot be overemphasized. Ukraine has lost a lot of people. Uh, Ukraine is in need of high municipal capacity to deliver those ambitious goals it has um, aimed for. And I would really like if, if there will be opportunities for you to find your municipality in Ukraine to get to those people and to advise them on the way how they can improve their practices and processes, but also how to work with those housing projects, which would be of immense value for the reconstruction. And on the Ukrainian side, Ukraine has to, one way or another, to merge those strategic documents to create this streamlined practice of how and why and what are the priorities in the municipality for the recovery to bring all of the things together and make them very simple and make them doable for municipalities and the whole Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for this very clear presentation about what is needed, uh, what is the challenge in Ukraine with regard to, to land policy and uh, spatial planning. Due to the wonderful timekeeping of our speakers, we have quite a, bit of, uh, quite a number of minutes for questions, concerns, things you want to share. Who would like to use the opportunity? The gentleman over there. I'll come towards you with the microphone. Or will you do it? Thank you very much, Boudewijn Piscair. Could you not build a modular and reconstructable temporarily for internally displaced people as a test for urbanization? That you can say, okay, I'm going to try this for, for a year or two to build here, and then you take everything along and move east again. And, and who are you directing your question to? To, to the speaker just before. Just as before. A, yeah. As a step. As, 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 a as a step towards uh, final construction, so modular, uh, reconstructable. Thank you. Yeah, advice to move here. Oh, are you? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much for your question. And I think that's one of the, one of the concerns that we've been having. There is another conference going on right this time in Warsaw, which is focusing on um, physical reconstruction of, of different areas and buildings which is hosted by Ukrainian Corporation uh, of Developers. And I think that is, that is the issue, I think, that, that concerns also me, that we've been talking a lot about you know, the physical side of this, but we are lacking knowledge and we're lacking understanding of how to bring those materials and those innovative building practices together to build something that lasts, as Larma said, for years to come, not for you know, five, seven years when it will be eventually dismantled or something and people will need to find other solutions. But to build something that keeps together uh, people as an institution in the municipality or in the region, rather than a physical building which has to be there, obviously, and has to be built in good faith and with good practice as you're offering. And that was one of the solutions, but I don't think that you know, practicality of the solution can assist us with you know, solving the problem in the long term. No. Okay. Thank you. The lady over there. <laughs> Sorry, <Eric. laughs> you have to walk a long distance. <laughs> Hi, Bernice Schoonmaker. I'm with Arcadus. 
and an urban planner myself, so I'm very impressed with your uh, um, explanation of the situation and the needs in uh, Ukraine right now. My question is about public-private partnership, and it's basically a follow-up on the question just now for the last speaker. Um, what, if any, uh, ways do you see to use and build a public-private partnership as a driver for recovery? <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> Okay, they hear me? All right. Um, thank you again for the question. So, right, um, I'm also basing my answer a little bit on the OECD report. And what they found out there, talking to 751 municipalities in Ukraine, that 40% of them, the capacity to do it at all. Um, and there was not suggestions or some, you know, uh, secondhand knowledge. There were municipalities who told that. Like, they don't know how to do it. And Ukraine, on the other hand, this is also about legislative side, which I'm not an expert in on this, on this point, but we don't have legislation for public-private partnerships. So to deliver those complicated um, issues, we have to get a cabinet of ministers working on this first. I don't think that municipalities will have the proper negotiating power when talking to private entities, being able to deliver actually the goals that the public enterprises can better than those private enterprises without having those, you know, uh, aligned legislation first. Oh, on the back. Thank you. I have a question uh, from the participant online, uh, Vlad. So uh, while many good practices and non-profit instruments were introduced today, what are the pathways and methods to build a political will for those policies and methods to scale them enough to challenge the current dominant macroeconomic trend? This, I think wow. to the overall... Uh, That's probably another symposium, isn't it? <laughs> Is there anybody willing Anyone? to answer this question? Julie, keep it short, please. <laughs> it's in the recovery plan already. So if Ukraine is to stick to page 148 to 149 of its own draft recovery plan presented in Lugano, there is a commitment to non-profit housing. So we would like to see that enacted by the um, government of Ukraine. Um, they set themselves the goal of December 2022 to deliver that task. If they're having trouble moving that along, there's some very capable people in the room who can help them. Great. One last question for this, for this part. I think I saw one other hand, the gentleman over there. I have a question about Finland. The municipalities, how do they access land plots? I assuming, I'm assuming it's they that, that are getting control of land plots. And is there a supply side subsidy embedded in the cost of that land? Uh, <laughs> I didn't really got the... <laughs> question but they have the capacity they have the monopoly of land use or the planning the municipalities they try to <clears throat> uh, buy the land as a raw land and then make the plan or they can make a deal with the land owner as well and take part of the the extra value to the municipality and use that money for the infrastructure and so on and give some part to the social housing under the market price, but I don't know what you ask, but that <laughs> Yes, 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 of course. I think it's, the, sa it's the same in the, in the Netherlands, yes, where like local authorities... countries and usually in the... Western local authorities have both the land and the planning power, and they can combine those two to have a stronger influence on what's going on. Um, that's it for this part of the program, and I give back to my boss. <laughs> Colleague. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think we had some, some very in interesting and very promising uh, presentations, and we learned about the challenges which are uh, ahead in, in Ukraine. We learned about the approaches, what can be done, what should be done, what could be done. But then, of course, it's time for action. And I think this is the last part of this session, goes about a call for action. 
and we have some very excellent speakers on this topic. We start with uh, um, Home Europe, Housing, Housing Europe. Europe. Then we have the financial partner, partners, always crucial if you want to get something done, how to build for an agenda. And then we'll end with more the political uh, speakers, the two ambassadors, the ambassador of the Netherlands in Ukraine and the ambassador of the Ukraine in the Netherlands. And that will be the final part of this, of this session. So we start first with, um, I get your name right, Sorcha Edwards, and she's yes, the Secretary General, if I understand correctly, yes. from Housing Europe. The floor Thank you. Goes. Thank you very much. Oops. Thank you very much for involving Housing Europe um, today. Uh, I have to say, it, the, the network has been mentioned a couple of times. It's bringing together 43,000 um, local housing providers across the EU, and we work with their federations at national level to be an interlocutor with the, with primarily with the European Union. Um, so. I have to say, uh, today's conference makes me even feel even more privileged um, to work for such a network. And one of the, the reasons is, and, and I think it can also link back to the last question on how we can gain more, more political support for establishing this type of, of um, housing system. And it's um, every day at Housing Europe, of course, we are aware of, of the housing shortages and housing challenges. However, we, because we work at European level, and we heard today there is no um, clear housing competence at European level within the European Commission for housing per se, we have to, uh, our, our, our advocacy has to go in in a tangential way. So, for instance, the energy efficiency and how proud we are every day to hear about examples coming from um, these organizations, these 43,000 cooperatives, municipal housing companies, limited profit housing uh, developers across the, across the whole region. They are pushing forward on the energy efficiency agenda. But not only that, if we talk to the European Commission about the the new, let's say, the industrial policy of the EU and the lack of housing for um, for workers in our capital cities. We hear from our members about what they're doing to tackle this and to provide affordable housing for workers. If we hear about students and the problems with mobility when it comes to Erasmus, we hear from our members about efforts from, for example, municipal housing companies in Italy, how they are converting uh, properties to cater for students. If we hear about migration, we hear efforts being made amazing from uh, housing associations associations here in the Netherlands, the social housing associations, work they did um, to accommodate people coming from um, Afghanistan, Syria, together with students from Amsterdam in a co-creation model um, and to where the students live together and at the same time um, helped to integrate people coming from war-torn areas. And the same with, um, with Ukraine. Obviously, we are facing a shortage of social housing. That's clear, particularly in our capital cities. However, we saw mobilization to try to help cater for people arriving from Ukraine. So I think we can clearly see that this is something really special in, in Europe. This um, fabric that has been built up over, we talked about the post-war era, but many of the organizations we hear at are operating for over 100 years in Europe. And I think it's really the only continent where we can talk about such um, a rich housing fabric that is, as I uh, put here, so not only, we, we heard from Vienna, so not only um, putting a band-aid on the problems, but trying to work in a preventative way on housing issues, but also societal challenges. And, and I think it's also clear, we heard about just um, in the urban planning, so how housing doesn't happen on its own, it, it's actually embedded in the urban, um, urban planning process. But I think the way our network has decided to put their vision in, in, in place, so those federations and, and housing providers, they say they want a vision for a Europe with decent housing for all and where all 
can people are able to reach their full potential. So they put the people at the center and the people's needs and those changing needs at the center of their activities. And I think this is what determines um, the, the reactivity to, the, to societal challenges and to the, to the housing crisis. And I think this can be showing clear examples. This is what we try to do. And my last slide will show you the housing evolutions up. We try to gather constantly these concrete examples of how housing can actually, um, while in many cases, I'm sorry to say, housing policy can be a driver of inequalities um, and of um, growing inequalities. However, what we try to show is that actually clever housing policy where we don't um, allow simply the extractive nature of capital to run free, so extracting profit at the short term, unregulated, um, where it's actually guided and driven, housing policy can actually be a driver of social progress and of social um, well-being for individuals and for society. So this is what we try to show, and I think it's a convincing vision when you get down to the concrete problems. Um, I have to say, um, so back a little bit to reality, it was mentioned earlier on by, by our, our colleagues. So what we have seen in the last decades is a globally a sort of retraction of public policy from from housing in many parts of, of the globe and, even, and, and of Europe. And I mean, if we follow the um, Saskia Sassen, for instance, and her work on financialization, just in one year we saw um, um, an investment of 60 billion euro in the top 100 cities and in real estate. That was just buying existing real estate. So it wasn't about putting value back into society. It was about extracting um, profit. It was about buying existing real estate, so not constructing. So we see, we, we saw over the last decades this um, rush of capital into the sector. And I think we all know from our personal experience what damage that can do. And also how the, the limited profit sector, um, cooperative limited profit, public end sector can act as a barrier to society, to that wall of money. And um, I, 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 I can only foresee that um, in Ukraine when hopefully sooner rather than later, there is peace again on the continent, that um, the wall of, of money and um, that now we have the donors in the room today, for instance, and some of them, I'm sure there are more out, out there, that this um, wall of money has, uh, has to be well managed so that it actually benefits all of society and not only um, uh, potentially, if not well managed, enriches uh, a few, the few. So this is as a short introduction as to why we, um, we worked as Julie Lawson as the, as the, as the lead author because we saw, um, um, going back a few years, a, a very much awareness of the housing affordability problem. And then we were frustrated because we saw all these excellent examples that exist in Europe. But yet we saw very simplistic proposals being put forward on how we should address housing affordability. Remove regulations, build as much as, supply, as, as possible, supply will meet demand, you'll be fine. And of course, we all know there are limitations to the supply and the demand when, uh, uh, principle when it comes to um, such an important infrastructure um, as housing. So this is why uh, we, looked, um, we, we worked on the Housing 2030. And, and the link with my last slide. So my last slide described the, the, the excellent work being done for, uh, by limited profit public housing providers to adapt to social challenges. But obviously, that's not happening in a vacuum. And I refer back to Alexandra's uh, 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 presentation just before and what we've been talking about today, the, the regulatory environment. So we tried to demystify a little bit the regulatory environment. Yes, it is complex, but when you break it down, what do you need? And we broke down into good governance, land policy, better finance, and obviously the, the raw cross-cutting challenge of how to adapt to um, uh, the climate, our climate responsibilities. So we, we broke it down into the building blocks and we, um, we looked across Europe, like what are the good examples that can actually demystify? What are the good governance um, principles, how can we uh, look at land policy so that it um, actually incentivizes and facilitates the delivery of affordable housing and better finance. So finance that is not extracting, um, um, extracting value, but finance that is actually looking at revolving funds that we heard about from Austria, from Finland, 
but actually it's a model that it, it's more and more popular. We see more and more copycats coming up um, at, the, at the moment. So um, this is the point. So this housing 2030, and I think um, this work to use housing 2030 as a practical tool to assist countries that actually do have a political win to, to improve their housing system. It's already been implemented and le led by my colleague Edith Lakotosh here in the room as well, who will be here also this evening if you, if you um, want to ask her more detail about that. So what we've been doing is try to extract those jewels, let's say, from um, a, good governance practices that are already working, you know? We don't have to reinvent um, the wheel each time and see, okay, how can they be, you know, what sort of jewels can be um, learned from and potentially uh, brought to new member, to, to other member states so that they can, let's say, avoid reinvent reinventing the wheel. And that's a very practical way of how it can work. So what, what we try to base it, and I think this is where we could fit together. So Julie Lawson showed in her last slide a type of platform of um, to bring together the different expertise, which could work with obviously the excellent um, uh, work that's been done um, uh, locally on the ground by CEDOS and New Housing Policy and the the, um, uh, the um, academic experts from Ukraine. So to bring together that knowledge in an organic way, not in a top-down, we are imposing, this is the housing truth kind of way, but to work together based on um, um, constant update on local needs to fill in the knowledge that's needed. And uh, this is, um, let's say, an idea on how we could fill it, fit in to the type of um, um, continuation of actually what we see today. We see a really amazing platform gathering together the different levels, the national, the municipal, the local um, and NGO partners in to, to bring together this hive mind to solve the issue. So I think, I hope our members also, we have representative of our French uh, member here in the room today, so it will also rely on their goodwill and their readiness to recognize that they actually um, were, were, let's say a lot of them came into being to address severe housing shortage in their different contexts. And I think they, they have shown that they feel this, um, let's say, responsibility um, to also share the expertise um, from their different systems with, with um, open coming systems and with particularly now in the, with Ukraine in this moment of, of need. So I finished there, I've gone over time. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. A lot of expertise within the organization, which can be very, very useful. Um, we continue and we move to the financial uh, sector, to the, the donors. And we will start with uh, Grigorts Gaida. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Um, from the European Investment Bank. Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I will be saying a couple of things about what we do in the sector of uh, housing and uh, how this can be used for the future uh, reconstruction of housing uh, in Ukraine. So um, I will start with uh, a very simple statistic. We finance about one to three billion euros of housing projects in uh, European Union uh, per year. So. Um, what we do is basically financing those examples that we have seen today. And frankly speaking, when I was sitting in the conference, I realized that um, I would not really tell you very much new things, actually, because uh, what we do is basically financing what, what you do. And um, I'm, very, I'm very proud of it. So um, what, is, what is really what we, what we finance? There was a map of Vienna to illustrate the case of uh, social integration. And I prepared a very similar map of Amsterdam. Every colorful building on the map is showing a building where social housing is located. And as you can see, uh, this is exactly as we have from Vienna. We all live together. And since we all live together, we don't have ghettos. We don't have good neighborhoods, bad neighborhoods. We don't have uh, easily identification of, uh, of, of people where, you know, if you leave at this address, there is no going to be a job for you or your children will not get to a good school. 
So um, the buildings that we finance look like this, and these are actual pictures. I took them myself uh, when I looked at one housing project that we were going to finance. So, so this is actually what we finance. So, so social housing is good housing. It's not cheap housing. It's, it's good housing. It's delivered in the way which is affordable. And this is actually the European social housing magic. And I think that would be something that I would try to maybe uncover a little bit uh, for you today. So, um, how we look at the, at the housing continuum, let's put it this way, uh, there is a whole spectrum of different ways housing can be provided to people in terms of uh, uh, who provides this housing, on which basis, what type of tenure there is, how things such as rent are de de defined. Within this continuum, we have to put a, a, a limit somewhere and on the, on the left side here, we finance, and on the right, right hand side, side we, we don't. Because um, as we have been discussing today, there is this issue of financialization of housing, so investments of um, movable, rapidly movable capital into housing markets typically causes very big increases of housing prices that negatively impacts uh, affordability of that sector for, for the people. So here, this is where we put uh, the limit and we finance only those housing that is directed to people who are actually vulnerable and have the needs to, to obtain support. Um, our principles are those three and uh, applied together, they create a workable mechanism for us as a financial institution to finance housing provision which is affordable and which does not create a drain on public finances. Why it is important? Um, systems that depend on continuous uh, subsidies from public budgets tend to lose the support once in a while and then they get into a situation where repairs are not done on time, where investments are not happening where they are needed, and they lead to deterioration of the system. And then the whole thing doesn't look that uh, nice. A, a ghetto is created, crime appears, big uh, problems in the quality of life. So all these all this systems have to meet these three criteria to be viable in the long term. And this is what we... This is what we check, and this is how we look at, at those systems that are presented for us for financing. Therefore, for Ukraine, we believe that based on the European best practices, uh, we can, together with our Ukrainian partners and with our European partners, help create a model that will actually be delivering on those, uh, on those goals. So we will build back better, not only with better technologies, but predominantly we would like to build back better with better institutional setup, with better organization, um, making sure that it will contribute to creation of uh, those cities that will follow the example of uh, the idea of 15-minute city. Uh, housing should be a very important element uh, of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move on. We go to the IMF, and that will be presented by Vladislav Rashkovan. He's online. He's online, yeah. Yes. Mr. Rashkovan, can you hear us? I hear you. Do you see me? Yes, we see you and we hear you. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was discussed already today several, several times that... Uh, you know, the World Bank in their rapid damage assessment uh, estimates that housing reconstruction in Ukraine will cost, you know, more than $69 billion. And it was also mentioned today that the, the, the government recovery plan, which is uh, present, was presented in Lugana, also showed that on top of that, uh, there will be also around like a $60 billion for renovation of heating system uh, in the regions, $40 billion for water supply, $30 billion for modernization of social infrastructure. Therefore, these amounts are really enormous. And uh, they don't exist now. The funding for this don't exist now. And you understand that housing is embedded in this uh, fabric of the cities, as we say. And the reconstruction of the cities uh, is not only about rebuilding of housing or, or infrastructure. It's 
is a chance for modernization of the Ukrainian citizen and, and uh, you know the and change potential change of the social fabric uh, of uh, of some of them uh, so social fabric you know, of some of them and therefore you know from the dreams uh, about funding of 100 billion dollars uh, uh, we really need to bring back as was said to the reality and uh, prior to investing even to the uh, money to this uh, to this housing we need to to answer many questions and financial questions but some of them not financial some of them are philosophical and uh, like do we need to rebuild a specific city at all maybe there is a reason not to do it you know or also we need to ask the strategic questions you know which cities you know may become magnets and, and magnets for what for education for sports for tourism for science for some value chain for labor force and uh, therefore the cities can be you know restructured uh, and housing there should be properly restructured according to the to the certain needs and uh, uh, I, I was listening to the representative from the housing of europe uh, there was uh, asking many other questions and uh, i'm thankful for the organizers uh, to launch today's symposium this is very helpful and i'm happy to, to continue this dialogue but i'm positioned now as a representative of the financial sector and expecting to to me to answer some financial questions like how to finance the reconstruction of housing who should finance what is the burden share between the investors uh, donors creditors and who should who should build itself and since uh, this panel is more like a call for action uh, let me try to find uh, some answers as a call for action so what are the principles of reconstruction jagish now said and this everybody was saying building back better it's not I mean, uh, as you might have seen, there is a World Bank report about that. It's pretty big. Uh, what does it mean? I think not many people still understand what it means. So I would kindly ask those NGOs uh, who are working on this to write more about that. It's not about only digital. It's not only about green. Uh, there are much more principles inside. So this is the first, you know, call for action mode to the to the NGOs involved in that. Second is who is who should finance? Again, Jagish now was saying uh, something about different types of the of housing, I think everyone should finance. You know, this, there is simply no single balance sheet in the world uh, which can single-handedly finance such huge bills for the reconstruction of Ukraine and specifically of housing. So there should be built partnerships which are which will go even beyond uh, the the regular uh, PPP. And I'm encouraging, you know, my World Bank colleagues and uh, you know EAB to start building those partnerships together with the private sector, together with governments. Uh, I'm sure there are lessons learned as Jagish now has said uh, from different types of the uh, of previous experience starting from Aceh in Indonesia you know to you know to, to Mozambique you know to different uh, countries which are Pakistan now under the flood uh, there are many you know in Pakistan is 1.5 million houses under the water and clearly there is a there is a good practice both on financing and uh, also rebuilding itself uh, existing in the world we maybe don't need to in intentionally to rebuild to to reinvent the the wheel for that uh, what is the role of state in that uh, i would really discourage you know the state of ukraine to think that the state can build everything there is simply it's a little bit socialism from one side second is there is no money for that uh, therefore you know the role of the state again there is, should be the public housing there should be affordable housing while it's still a tragedy you know it's a disaster for ukraine but those who can pay they should be at least contributing a part of that uh, through the mortgage schemes for the compensation schemes maybe there is a room also for the corporate housing is a well-developed model in us for example when there will be the corporate business will participate and therefore they will rent out uh, the um, uh, the the apartments to people especially for internally displaced people while the donors uh, in the part of the of the partnership can build a model of uh, of compensation of interest rates you know what is the role of donors donors clearly you know one of the major instrument uh, which is really needed now is uh, the war guarantees and i'm encouraging mega but now the, the will be a topic for the london conference in june how to ensure more of these guarantees how to build the insurance war insurance market for such a big and tragic tragic case like in ukraine because clearly the most investors now are very much afraid that as soon as you start building the the buildings can become tomorrow the target for the for the russian invaders and this is very much important uh, you know and the donors can also build this compensation scheme for those people who cannot afford the full price of the mortgage uh, but it doesn't mean that they need to repay the, the part of the principle for those people who can still pay the loans what are the prerequisites do we need to wait for the end of the war i strongly believe no and there were some 
some questions today about the modular buildings versus not modular buildings. And I think uh, we need to invest some money for the temporary real estate. And uh, we were discussing this with BRD and other donors that probably we need to create a fund uh, which could uh, allocate, uh, you know, like 100,000 houses for modular houses for temporary living in Ukraine. Uh, and therefore, later, maybe to relocate these to other war zones in the world, to Mali, to Burkina Faso, where they might be needed. But we need uh, that uh, uh, modular houses in Ukraine. Why? Because another one of the major principles for the reconstruction, and this will be a problem we'll finish here, is uh, the buildings should be, uh, the, the reconstruction of housing should be done strongly advisable with the uh, hands of people, of citizens of those cities, of those people who are living there. Uh, and this is what is named community-based reconstruction, is the best example, best practice in the world, because this is not only, again, but as I said in the beginning, about the, the physical building, it's also about the community building. People should be feeling that this is their house. And apparently the legacy of Soviet Union was that we were taking most of these houses as granted uh, uh, because it went from, from, from that time. Uh, while now we really need to build around the housing reconstruction process, also the, the process for rebuilding of the, uh, of the cities and communities of the cities. And this is, will be a path for towards Europe. Thanks, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Some very clear points from the call for action. Um, we start moving to the government uh, representatives, and I would like to invite Yanis de Mol, the Dutch ambassador in Ukraine, who by incidence is in the Netherlands, and we yes. make use of it. Floor is yours. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, having listened to, uh, to our forum and our discussions uh, today, the question is very much where to start, because it is huge. And um, let me start by the position of the Netherlands with regards to, to Ukraine. That is actually very clear. We are there to support Ukraine, and we go all the way. That has been said by our prime minister. That means that we're active in the military field, uh, we are active uh, when it comes to supporting the military wherever we can. If we have things, we provide them. If we don't have them, we try to arrange it. And if we cannot arrange it, we try to buy it. Uh, very straightforward. Um, then there is this whole idea of the economic, uh, the financial aspect. It's always difficult to speak after uh, uh, Vladislav Rashkovan because he's very knowledgeable and very eloquent. But uh, when it comes to, to the budget, you have to understand that every month uh, Ukraine misses about 5 billion euros. That's the deficit, you know, that's the size of the problems. So we're chipping in. And uh, Mr. Rashkovan is part of the uh, Dutch-led uh, IMF team in, in Washington. So we cooperate with Ukraine very closely. And as an ambassador, and that is the nice thing about this forum, I deal with almost all the organizations that are active here. Uh, I'm part of, uh, let's say, uh, the EU. I'm part of uh, EBRD, EIB. I see uh, individuals like Philco uh, quite often. Um, but uh, that is the beauty of, of an embassy. Then you have the humanitarian aspect, um, winterization getting through the winter. Let's be honest, while we were listening to this, uh, all these presentations, one of the speakers at the IOM uh, office had this uh, alarm going off. You know, I don't know whether you heard it, and it said, may the force be with you. Uh, but this is the reality. There's a war going on. And uh, three times a day, uh, there's an alarm coming in. Uh, drones, uh, uh, Shahid... Uh, 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 killer drones uh, on their way, cruise missiles, etc. There's a war going on. So let's be reasonable here as well. And um, for the Netherlands, there is, apart from, the, let's say, the military, the economic part, humanitarian part, there's also accountability. This is very much about MH17, about truth, justice and accountability. So we're very heavily involved in everything that goes with tribunals and uh, uh, getting justice done. 
So also with forensic experts, teams working in cities that were uh, occupied and where horrible things come out in order to let's attempt to repair the damages to people individually, not only material, but also psychologically. So it starts with accountability. And uh, more than 60,000 cases are already documented. And it's only the beginning, you know. So that is also something that we have to understand. Um, so a lot of money is being invested. Uh, we try to be a good partner in a sense, a predictable partner. So I think uh, last year we spent about 2 billion euros uh, in, in Ukraine. This year the government committed already 2.5 billion euros in order to be able to help in a predictable, predictable way uh, Ukraine. And um, uh, that is actually what we, we understand very much that this, this war on Ukraine is going to last. And we hope for the best, of course, but we prepare also for the worst. So it means long-term commitment. And whatever comes, we will be with them shoulder to shoulder for a long time. Also knowing that the, let's say, the path of development is Euro-Atlantic integration. So that is going to be a leading uh, principle. So the Green Deal, for example, is definitely an instrument to guide policy making in, in Ukraine. Um, having listened to the stories and the, 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 the interventions today, um, you know, there is a difference between short term and long term. And short term is, is it's, you know, there are millions of people going from east to west. They need a house, they need a job, they need to survive. And their, uh, let's say, bank accounts, they go down because after a while they cannot afford anymore to live somewhere. So that is the reality. So people need a house above their head. They are very creative. Resilience of the Ukrainian people is enormous. They are an example. They lead by example. And at the same time, they need jobs to survive on the short term. So this is the time to think about the future and make plans and I like initiatives like Roskvit uh, that I follow a little bit, but also the UN-UN uh, initiatives. And it's very good to think about the future, but also come up with short-term solutions so that people actually see that there is a difference being made. And they need also hope and perspective. Because after a year of full-fledged invasion, you sometimes get desperate. So where is this going to end? This is the reality. And the war started in 2014, like you said. I was there with the ME-17. That was the time. And uh, in 1919, when I, of 2019, when I came back, there were 14,000 victims on the Ukrainian side, 40,000 uh, wounded people, and 400,000 veterans. Now it's a multitude. So psychologically, in the social uh, fabric of the society, there's a lot going on. And we have to take that on board. Um, at the same time, I'm impressed, as I said, by the resilience and by the preparedness. The strength of Ukraine, yes, one minute. The strength of Ukraine is actually in NGOs. Invest in NGOs. And as an international community, um, I also would like to urge you to do your homework. Invest in cultural awareness. Because I see so many people coming with good intentions, but not having real uh, local understanding. So look for partners. Go and partner. Look for knowledge about where you are active. And that is actually something that, that I would like to urge you. I very much like the uh, presentations by Alina, by Alexander, because they're based, oh, also Setos, on the because they're based on actually what is going on. They come from far, because let's be honest, uh, a lot of infrastructure was Soviet type, but they can go very, very fast. And this is, with all due respect, also an opportunity for Ukraine. And let's help them to take that opportunity.
Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very, very much. From a wide scope, you could get the impression it's an impossible task, but you ended up with a very hopeful, a very enlightening vision. And I uh, really, really inspiring. And then we move to the last speaker, and that's in fact your colleague, but then the other way around. I would like to uh, invite Maxim Kononenko, the uh, Ukraine ambassador in the Netherlands, to take the floor and take us with us, with you. Thank you very much. If Yenes, my good friend, uh, he doesn't know but what begin, uh, I'm always have a good solution. I will begin by thanking, by say, by say, uh, by thanking the Netherlands for all these efforts deployed to help Ukraine during these very dark and difficult times. And uh, I would like to express my my gratitude to the organizer of this wonderful event. Uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today here. And uh, special thanks uh, goes to the speaking experts for sharing their progressive ideas on ways how to recover Ukraine housing sector. When visiting such events here in the Netherlands, I'm always pleasantly surprised by the high interest shown by the Dutch government, public organizations, Dutch businesses, and civil society on Ukraine. It has been almost a year since uh, the start of the war that Russia unleashed against Ukraine. During this time, we witnessed how the Ukrainian people and soldiers bravely defended the sovereignty and independence of the Ukrainian state, showing the highest standards of courage in battle. According to the estimates of military experts during this time, during this period, about 5,000 missiles were launched on the territory of Ukraine. Unfortunately, most of them, most of the targets, uh, more than 93% belong to the civilian infrastructure. And in particular, among things, more than one 170,000 units of the residential area of Ukraine were either damaged or destroyed as, as a result of military operations, leaving thousands of, thousands of Ukrainians without homes. However, I'm deeply convinced that after every storm, there is a silver, silver lining. Uh, watching the wonderful presentations and lively interest of the attendees of this event fills me with hope for the future. And I'm convinced that the reconstruction of Ukraine will become one of the most significant proje projects in recent years, which can be compared only with Marshall Plan. Yes, it, it goes without saying without any doubt that Ukrainian recovery program will be the largest pro reconstruction project since World War II, providing in particular a new impetus to the European economy as well. And private investment is expected for defense, industry, agricultural sector, IT, renewable energy, gas production, processing of titanium and other minerals, logistic development, and of course, construction we've discussed today. Uh, first step has already been made. On 13th of January, uh, the government of Ukraine established uh, a state agency for restoration and infrastructure development on Ukraine, of Ukraine. And we understand that we have a lot of homework to do. Uh, we will work on further deregulation and improvement of business climate in Ukraine, including by canceling licenses and permits and simplifying administ administrative procedures. 
By such projects, but such projects like, uh, like reconstruction of Ukraine cannot be uh, carried out by forces of only one country. In order to implement the grand plan, Ukraine needs to support the support and help of all our partners. And in this context, I want to emphasize once again the importance of the Dutch side's interest to the, in the reconstruction of Ukraine. Tomorrow in Ukraine, we will need Dutch farmers, Dutch businessmen, Dutch engineers, Dutch construction companies, Dutch architects, even more than we need today vehicles. So we count a lot on, on Dutch participation in our reconstruction effort. And I really hope that ideas expressed today in this room will be reflected in real projects on the territory of Ukraine already in near future. At the same time, as ambassador and patriot of my country, as well as a person who takes everything very close to my heart, I am forced to emphasize that we should not wait until the end of the war, at least to start the process of negotiation and discussion especially in re recovering the housing se segment. So we urge all businesses that are willing to partici participate in Ukraine's recovery plan not to hesitate, not to wait, and open this dialogue together with the Dutch government, Ukrainian government, conve conveying ideas, searching for solutions and opportunities in building a new and better future for Ukraine, for the Netherlands, and for the whole Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Now it's my task to close the session, and I will not try to summarize uh, what has been said, um, because it has been a wide diversity of content, of hope, of inspiration, perhaps a little bit of dreaming, I hope, um, in the most difficult circumstances that you can imagine in which Ukraine at the moment uh, is. But however, I think it was a very fruitful and a very constructive uh, meeting. And I would like to thank all the speakers for their contribution and especially that they stick within time in an excellent way. Because I thought for me, together with my colleagues, the hardest job would be the timekeeping, but that went very well. So I would like to have an applause for all the speakers which <laughs> contributed to that. <laughs> then the second part is that there will be a follow-up of this meeting. And uh, as I already said, the, the, the event, the, the video will be put online with English subtitles, but also in Ukrainian. Uh, subtitles. So people who missed it or want to look back, they have the possibility to, to do that. Furthermore, PBL, RMIT and our partners from New Housing Ukraine and UNUN will write a small report about this session with the outcome, with the input, using all the input that has been used so that it's also documented, which was also suggested and asked for uh, in the meeting. And we will discuss with our partner future activities uh, that can be done as a follow-up of this meeting. I think there's a lot of possibilities for next steps and, 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 and moving ahead. So that's the follow-up. So we will take, uh, together with our partners, the lead in that. And that means that I will be closing down the meeting. I would like to thank all the viewers um, at home uh, who stayed with us this afternoon. I would like to thank everybody in the audience. And my last question would be that everybody who was involved in organizing this meeting to stand up so we can give them a big hand of applause. <laughs> for taking place. So, thank you very much. Uh, we close the session uh, so the, the cameras will be off.
And the people here are invited to join us with a little drink and to have some more discussions together. And see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>